Buenos días, grandes maestros del futuro. Estamos en la transmisión número 97 de Karate Do MX en casa. No lo puedo creer, estamos eh, junto al Hanshi, Hanshi, Patrick McCarthy. How are you, Hanshi? Bueno, Paco, -san. ¿cómo estás? <risa> Muy bien, gracias, mi amigo. <risa> Hanshi, so, for, for, for those that don't know you, who are you? <risa> Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm a, a Canadian who uh, became very passionate about karate in back in the 1960s. And uh, after a very long journey of travel, I decided that in the mid 1980s to uh, immigrate to Japan and uh, in pursuit of studying uh, this beautiful art that brings us together. And uh, uh, I resided in Japan for 10 years or so. And then I had a, a job offer Uh, with the Australian Karate Federation uh, president, who at the time was also the uh, treasurer for the World Karate Federation. And um, he had been following my research and was looking for someone like myself to head up a post uh, position in Australia uh, uh, in uh, you know what I do in the uh, the study of uh, you know this art, it's anthropology and culture, uh, people, pioneers, contributions. Uh, basically, what was the purpose of the art outside of the immediate aspect of uh, punching and kicking, physical fitness, self defense, and so uh, that uh, focus was largely on the. You know, of, of course, the application basis of kata, but also a look at its, its a, a historical evolution, a philosophy, a spiritual aspect, a holistic, pedagogical, and, and even the art as an industry. Okay. And uh, so we stayed in Australia for, oh gosh, 20... <laughs> four years and um, and I became a dual citizen of Australia because being a Canadian you know green and country you know the, uh, I was able to do that and then of course you know my and my children who, who were actually born in Japan um, um, have grown up and gone away actually they're back working in Japan of all places and you know my wife is of course Japanese I married a, a Japanese And so uh, we thought, because of uh, our organization, the uh, research group has become quite large and certainly given birth to many other similar groups. We decided that maybe during the, now it's getting closer to my retirement, maybe I'm going to come back to live in North America. And we decided upon Los Angeles uh, to uh, retire here. And so, actually, uh, it's August now. This time last year, we immigrated to the United States. So, I've kind of gone a long way around here, but so I'm a Canadian. Now, now in uh, my mid-60s, uh, who's lived in Japan and Australia and now United States. <laughs> and just, uh, <laughs> you know, we were speaking about this just before I, uh, just before we went live. And I, I mentioned to you that, uh, you know, um, sadly, uh, especially with this uh, coronavirus pandemic, um, it's we decided against living here now, and we're we're gonna we're gonna get out, and then uh, go back to Japan is where we're gonna go and um, retire to Okinawa. So that's who I am. 
<laughs> so, so I cut that a short version. I'm a yeah, yeah. I'm a person just like you, uh, who loves karate. And uh, um, thinking about your your sensei and Okinawa, what is the relationship between Kinjo Hiroshi and Toyama Kanken? I'm sorry, Paco. Can you just say that again? Because the acoustics, I couldn't hear it too well. Uh, what is the relation between Kinjo Hiroshi and Toyama Kanken? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, as you know, uh, uh, they're both Okinawans, and um, they are both um, two Okinawans who left uh, the tiny island community uh, to come up to uh, the mainland of Japan. And if you look at who were the, let's say, uh, most important personalities to leave the island and come up to the mainland of Japan in an effort to uh, introduce the Okinawan fighting arts, you will find a list that goes something like, Look, in, in no special order, I'm just going to pull them out of my head. Uh, <laughs> Motobu Choki, um, uh, Matayoshi Shinko, uh, Gima Shinken, uh, Funakoshi Gichin, uh, Chitozi Tsuyoshi, uh, of course, uh, uh, 1928, Miyagi Chojin and Mabuni Kenwa. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Toyama Kanken. A uh, Kinjo Hiroshi, because Kinjo Sensei is a uh, younger, significantly younger, although passed away now. Um, the connection was not just that they were Okinawan, but both men uh, had a vision uh, that was slightly different than their predecessors or contemporaries about how the art should come together. Please remember when, when Toyama Sensei <clears throat> was quoted as saying, and we're talking about styles right now, and I want to talk yeah. about that. For you. Toyama Sensei said, When I die, my style dies. And, and what he meant to say was, of, you know, of course. Of course, you know, uh, when you teach something, uh, in, in my opinion, you, 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 you don't necessarily teach uh, what to learn over how to learn. And Toyama was very, very much a stickler on how you should learn, not necessarily what you should learn, because in, in what you should learn, there are, uh, you know, some obvious things. You know, from an art of self-defense, you know, he believed very much in what I refer to as acts of physical violence, which are habitual in human nature. So if you're teaching or learning self-defense, then you have to be uh, governed if I can use that word, by what you're going to be up against. I don't, I don't want to talk about uh, weapons. I don't want to talk about the gang or multiple assailants. That's a completely different story altogether and, and not a pretty one. But just one against one, empty-handed, domestic civil violence inherent in human social environment, like domestic society. And uh, Toyama was a, a big stickler on, you know, it, it's everybody, it doesn't matter if they're Korean or, uh, and, and of course, you know, we're gonna talk about the Koreans as well, but, uh, you know, or Chinese or, um, uh, or Japanese or foreign, um, a person has two arms and two legs and, they, and, and, a, and some type of brain and they can hurt you. 
and and you need to learn how to defend against that. And keep in mind, I mean, he you know, he trained with uh, Higona Kanjo, Kitoso Ampo, and a, a handful of other uh, uh, notable Okinawan pioneers. So, but but he's hardly ever talked about. You know, uh, I uh, have a very dear friend who lives in uh, Austria, Vienna. Okay. His name is Christian Bellina. And uh, was it something I said? No, I'm just joking. Where'd you go? Oh, yeah, Toyama Sansa. <laughs> oh, that's that's Christian's book. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he, he's a lovely person, by the way. He's one of the very few uh, gentlemen I know. Uh, you know, Chiana said something like, uh, Karate aims to build character, but it doesn't guarantee it. It did in the case of Christian Bolino. Anyway, wonderful. Christian, if you're listening, almost I win. So, uh, so anyway, the relationship between uh, uh, Toyama and uh, Kinja were, uh, I, think, uh, I think, a typical story of uh, need and desire. And uh, Kinjo sensei, Oh, I'm getting a picture. Let me see. Ah. Oh, that's my, actually, that's my photograph. I took that photo. <laughs> Kinjo said it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. Oh, courtesy of Patrick McGarvey. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was a beautiful man. You know, he's he's still here with me every day. I, not a day goes by, I don't often think about him. You know, really, you know somebody just recently was uh, saying, oh, McCarthy, McCarthy never practiced with uh, Kinjo Hiroshi, you know. Kinjo, I, I, you know. Anyway, I don't want to think about it. You know, so, so look, look. Uh, the relationship between the two, they worked together. They formed an organization together. Uh, Kinjo Sensei in those days was regarded as probably, probably I, I don't think anybody would argue uh that Kinjo Hiroshi was not the premier uh, karate journalist, if you will, of that era. You know, he created the um, Gekken Karate Do uh, magazine format. And he his work brought him in co to contact with everybody, you know, Funatoshi, Mabuni, Miyagi, Multiple Choki, everybody, you know. So, so and I was very fortunate. Uh, my teacher in the United States, Richard Kim, uh, had always spoken so highly of you know, Kinjo Hiroshi, a walking encyclopedia. You know, one day if you ever meet Kinjo, you will blah, 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 blah. blah. So, you know, you got to remember when, you know, long ago when I was a boy learning, I never thought that I was going to go to Japan or one day meet all these people, much less have Kinjo as my teacher. I, ne I never, I never thought that. So, so it's funny. My wife calls it fate. I call it luck. Um, <laughs> but no, it, it, they had a wonderful relationship between the two of them. Toyama Kankan, as you know, was uh, one of the youngest uh, martial art masters recognized. Um, Shudokan was uh, really uh, the brainchild of a, a wonderfully innovative um, and uh, a beautiful man. And, and I just want to go back to when he said, you know, when he said, when I die, my style dies. Of course, he didn't mean that the principles of what he stood for will die. He just meant this, that the, the karate that me, my body, my mind, my lifetime of experience uh, has become will not be yours. Yours is going to be a different journey. We, we, we don't all uh, look at the same thing the same way to achieve the same outcome. It's just, uh, it's, uh, it's like, uh, uh, here's a wonderful metaphor that uh, Joe Sensei taught me. Uh, I'll share it with you. Um, so, so karate brings together in a, in a dojo. Karate brings together uh, science and art, it, and it brings the fusion of these two things together to produce something. 
But there's a lot of dynamics around the fusion and its production. So he said, uh, Patrick, think of this. Okay, you have uh, many people studying art. Let's say, let's say painting. And, uh, you know, there, there's science. There's science to the painting. You know, uh, there's the brushes, uh, big brushes to get the, you know, and the little tiny brushes to get the eyebrows and, you know, and, and the, you know, maybe you get the, you know, a rag, <laughs> rag, you know, to rub in some of the clouds. Uh, and, the, you know, then you get the, uh, you can have pastels or you can have uh, oil or you can have, uh, you know, ink. In different, different, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you know, the Japanese, uh, the Japanese are very simple. Uh, uh, beauty in simplicity. White canvas, black ink, red hunkle, you know. Uh, Chinese, very confusing. Dragons, mountains, tigers, uh, but beautiful, a little bit confusing. So, so Kinzo Sensei said, you've got the canvas, the ink or the paint or the pastel, the brushes or the crayons, uh, you got the palette, and uh, then someone says, okay, paint uh, a rose. So why uh, after two hours or one hour or one day or one week when the project is over, why do all the roses look differently or when the flowers look different? And that's because of what's inside each of us is something different. Okay. So we don't all do and see the same thing the same way. And that's the beauty of the art. But it doesn't change the science. And Toyama was a person like that. And Kinjo Hiroshi was, uh, you know, uh, in my opinion, a bumburyodo, uh, a bujin, you know, uh, a person who understood the value of uh, uh, the uh, journalistic or <laughs> oh, that's my crest. Yeah. Wow. I'm sure we're going to talk about that too. So, hey, can I just say, first of all, uh, can I just say uh, how uh, happy I am here? Because I know we've been we've been wanting to talk ever since we met at the uh, KNX, and uh, and uh, the whole uh, beautiful mixture of how the cosmic energy works in the world <laughs> to bring like-minded people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hey, so how are, how how is everybody there? I I haven't seen everybody since uh, KMX, and you and I only speak uh, on uh, uh, yeah, video and stuff like that. So how how are they? Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. fine. <laughs> There's so many things to talk about. You you have to. By the way, I, I'm really quite known for uh, jumping off the horse and going in different directions uh, all the time. So uh, please don't. I don't hesitate to say, hey, okay. you're talking about this. So, <laughs> and by the way, sorry, I, I, I just looking at myself, I look, it looks like I'm looking down, but I'm actually, the camera's up here, but you're down there, so I'm at, I hope I'm not <laughs> distracting everybody. Maybe I look up here instead or something. So. No, it's okay, it's, it's okay, Hashira. There's no okay. problem. So you said the, the word fighting art. So what do you prefer to, to tell to, to our art? Uh, martial art, fighting art, or life art? What is your vision about that? Well, um, the, in my opinion, we're not doing a martial art. We're not in the military. And uh, we're, you know, we're not soldiers. And the motivation for our learning, our practice, and our teaching um, is not the same as being in a military that belongs to a government that has a specific set of outcomes which are accomplished in a specific way. The fact that there might be some similarities in, say, hand-to-hand -hand combat, that's beside the point. So I don't use the word martial, although I, you know, after more than 50 years of study and I, I do understand the uh, the uh, 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 connection historically to how these arts unfolded, and 
where in the long chain of historical uh, observation it comes from. So, but no, we. This is not a martial art, in my opinion. This is a fighting art, and the fighting part of the art is um, the principal focus of learning, training, and practice. And they say that the fighting art when likened to a pathway, um, it depends how far down the pathway one gets before it becomes evident that the destination is not the goal. It is the journey. And in this regard, we speak about a life art. So... All and any pathway, as far as I'm concerned, irrespective of the the name, you know, the fancy name you might want to. Oh, this is a Acme Ru. You know, it uh, that pathway has to do four things. It has to condition your body. It has to cultivate your mind. And it has to nurture your spirit. And the fourth part of this is the actual hands-on process, or what I call pathway process. It has to be functional. Because if it's not functional, and it becomes wrapped up too much in overly ritualized uh, physical practices um, through being taught what to learn rather than how to learn, okay. it becomes so, dysfunctional. So stop here because here's the, the question. Um, one of our viewers, Beltran de la Cueva, oh. good morning. Um, oh. <laughs> Has the, practical, <laughs> has the practical of Kata gone too far away from the un ancient? Are we? Of are we live? Is this live? Yeah, it's live. Oh my God. <laughs> How's my hair? <laughs> Your hair is looking good, almost like I, mine. I use that in the singular form. You notice. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. And I think that we can link this question with um, why did you create Koruchinadi? Good morning. Is your experience about has uh, Kata gone too far? Yeah. If it's the yeah. same essence of Kata of the ancient and right now it's the same. Can you hear the dogs outside barking? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Apologies. I love animals, that's my problem, so. <clears throat> um, yeah, look, um, absolutely. The kata, kata, kata was never, never, never meant to teach you anything. That's not the purpose of kata. Kata was meant to remind you of what you had already learned in the, the defensive lessons before you got to the kata. You had the two-person practices that are scenario-driven self-defense practices which are reenacted by two people. Uh, one person is... Uh, Rehearsing, if you will, or, or reenacting uh, a particular act of violence, headlock, bear hug, head, you know, uh, grappling uh, on the ground in a clinch, uh, uh, punching, kicking, maybe combinations thereof. And the other person is learning how to protect, uh, maybe clinch. And there's, a, there's this little process of, you know, receiving 
uh, responding, uh, capturing, controlling, uh, which is which is uh, rehearsed. I want to use this term first. Rehearsed in passive resistance. Not, not the full aggression, passive resistance until the, the learner uh, begins to feel comfortable with the, the process of engagement and, and rehearsal. And, and once, the, once the, the, the learner becomes familiar and, and comfortable uh, with that, then the attacker steps up the aggressive resistance uh, uh, gradually, gradually to exponentially so that the end process, and, and look, the end process it might take a few hours, it, it might take a few days, it could take a few weeks, it, it could take months. And, 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 and here's the thing. It might never happen with some people. But at the end result, and, and, and sorry, sorry, sorry. In the middle of this transition, you meet my friend, Sensei Murphy. Now, who is Sensei Murphy and what does he have to do? Okay. Thanks for asking. <laughs> you can tell my sense of humor, right? So <laughs> Sensei Murphy is my little imaginary friend who, when all hell breaks loose, is the, is the, is the mechanism that teaches you what can go wrong, will go wrong, when you don't want it to go wrong. And by virtue of the attacker in the two-person scenario-driven um, uh, practice um, becomes much more aggressive, it becomes more difficult to rehearse your, uh, the application of your defensive concepts. And it's, so it's, it's through this process you know, you first of all, we're learning from the tradition. I showed you what to do. I explained how it's going to work. You're trying it back and forth. Uh, you know, it's easy to do in slow motion. I love uh, uh, Mike Tyson's quote, you know, everybody's got a plan. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but, but I mean, that's the reality of, of, of the brutality of physical violence is that you're going to get, you're going to get hurt and you're going to get hit. But that's why I say uh, a pathway that has to condition your body and cultivate the mind, nurture the spirit. You can't give up you, just because you get punched in the face or headbutt or stabbed. Or, you can't give up uh, because if you do, the alternative is not pretty. And so the process of the two-person drill is, and by the way, I, I noticed earlier you painted, playing a couple of Tegumi drills. Uh, those are flow drills, by the way. Flow back and forth, back and forth. That lovely, lovely practices, but not two-person scenario-driven self-defense practices. That's a different thing. So anyway, so at the end of this practice, you know, you've learned from tradition. Then somewhere in the middle, you realize, oh, this is not working for me. I have to approach it this way. And, and the I part means the part that's not usually discussed or talked about in the traditional pathway of learning karate. And that's the part of uh, gender, uh, age, individuality, uh, 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 physical uh, capacity. You know, if you're a, uh, oh, here it is. I'm a 29 year old uh, alpha male. And there's nothing I can't do. I'm the world champion. And, and oh, and uh, here he is, uh, 40 years later, when he's a 75 years old. Hello, I'm the same person. Okay, so, or, 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 you know, because 
You know, alpha athletes don't get it the same as a better or fitter human beings. Uh, women, this is not discriminatory. It's just a fact that uh, women don't learn the same as men. Children don't get it the same as adults. Older people, uh, uh, intellectually impaired, physically impaired, they, they're not all capable of doing the same thing the same way to get the same outcome. So if that's the case, why then do they learn? Why are they being fed the same thing? So, and that's the, and we talked about, say, Toyama, for example. That's what Toyama meant when he said, it's not, when I die, my style dies. Not your style, you're still alive. You have your own style. So, so let me go back to, we're talking about Kata. So the two-person process, it sums up what we call a shuhari, shuhari process. You learn from tradition. You know, you, 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 you have a, you're struggling in, in, in that tradition and you ultimately break the chain of that tradition. And then, and then you, 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 you transcend that tradition because you found what worked for you using these timeless uh, mechanisms which are supported by uh, immutable, immutable principles, principles that don't change. And, and that, that's why I love, you know, you just showed my crest. We can talk about that in a minute. But when I was uh, younger and uh, trying to think of, uh, oh gosh, I've been going up this mountain. I used a mountain metaphor, you know, because I go up the mountain. The further up the mountain I get, the fewer styles I see. I, you know, it's, I'm, not, I'm not overly concerned by the cosmetic appearance of what you're doing or, you know, if your crest is on the, you know, or the, this is your lineage or, you know, your certificate or, you know, people <laughs> use, no, but it's, well, see, nobody wants to talk about that either, you know, except for me. And that's why I get targeted quite a bit, you know. Oh, he's disrespecting tradition. Actually, I don't think so. I'm highly respectful of tradition. What I think is people's understanding of tradition becomes so distorted that they miss the point. Tradition isn't about following a guy around who's got the ashes of the, the founder in a box. That, that's not the point. The point hasn't always will be continuing to seek out what the pioneers were looking for in a uh, methodical fashion to keep the tradition alive and functional. That's tradition. And anyway, so I was thinking about, well, I want to I wanna look back uh, historically and genealogically uh, because people tend to use three things to, uh, uh, to uh, you know, accredit themselves or, you know, make whatever it is they say credible. I've been training for a hundred years. My teacher was God. I'm a fifth down, you know. No, uh, but is that true? I mean, they always use rank, lineage, and time. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. None of which have anything to do with protecting your ass. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I think these guys got to do some more sit-ups or something that the belt doesn't fit around the waist anymore, you know. And, and, and they get so wrapped up in, you know, doctrine. Anyway, so I'm sorry. See, I'm jumping off the horse again, uh, Paco. But here's the <laughs> point I mean to say. So I'm thinking, what can I, the further up the mountain I get, I, I start, at, at first I'm not happy with it you know, because it's so contradictory to what, I'm, what I've been taught and what I believe, you know. I think, oh, my God, you know, I mean. So uh, I think, okay. And then I remembered something. I was working on a project once, uh, doing some translations. Of, you know, I, brought, I brought together some work from uh, Bushi Matsumura and, uh, you know, some guys from in and around his era and uh, other people who are not well known on the, on the modern spectrum. And, and anyway, and so something he said made me think of this, you know, um, you know, <laughs> by the way, you should have asked me the answers when I was younger. That's when I knew everything. You know, when I was younger, I knew everything. So, you know. 
You yeah. should have asked me that because now I don't know everything. Now I realize I don't know everything. So. But here's what I thought. And, and these are, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what I believe Matsumura was trying to tell us. You know, I was working on the, the first English translation of, uh, of his seven principles of the book. You know. and, uh, and, you know, I keep in mind the Confucian uh, uh, base uh, uh, foundation from which people think, which is about, you know, the first, the first um, tenet of Confucianism is filial piety, which is ancestor worship, you know, so and that, that means that you can't, as a rule, you don't question authority, you don't question the people who came before you. And I thought, here's what I think Matsumura is trying to say. And even if this is not what he was trying to say, it's what I want to extract from what he was saying. He said this, for those who continue to suffer an imbalance from ego-related distractions. Let humility, the cornerstone upon which this modest fighting art rests, serve to remind us to place virtue before vice, values before vanity, and principles before personalities. And I thought about that. You know, I'll tell you why I like that so much, was because it had nothing to do with the mechanics, timeless acts of physical violence, and the, and the common or universal principles that teach us about the only two parts that are necessary in physical training. One is motion. Remember motion, movement, forces, mass times acceleration, kinetic energy transfer, that's motion. And when you think about karate, the first thing you see is striking. That's our first. That's how we do it over, say, judo or jiu-jitsu. We, we like to strike people first to make them weak and then put them to sleep or you know, joint lock, pressure point, take down, strangulation, throw, grappling, groundwork, escapes, counters, but, you know, all of the mix, the alphabet of what it is we do. And the other part beyond percussive impact is about seizing. So the mechanisms behind seizing have to do with the five ancient machines. Okay, maybe some of your friends are going to ask, what are, what are they? The five ancient machines are, can you, do you remember them? One, the, the most famous is the wheel, axle and the wheel. And then, of course, there's the levers. You know how they put the big stones for the pyramids, you know? And then how do they, how do they lift the big stones up to the top of the pyramid is the pulley. The pulley. And then there's the, the wedge, the tishige, the wedge. And then there's one more. Can you think about it? Uh, so we said the wheel. We said wheel. Pulley, the pulley, the pulley. The pulley. The wedge. Okay. No, it's, it's the screw. The screw. The, the, you know, the... <laughs> Twisting it. So anyway, what I want to say is this, is everything else, seizing, whether you seize with your hand or two hands or your arm or your legs or even your teeth, seizing is supported by the same mechanism. And you need to know these mechanisms. You know, uh, 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 this is this is a uh, you know uh, flexion, extension, pronate, supinate, invert, avert, rot. You know, yeah, these are words which mean specific things. Anyway, let's see. so it's percussive impact or it's seizing. That's everything. So I, I think about uh, you know Archimedes. 
He told, he told us, show me a place to stand, give me a lever, I will move the world. I said, Newton, it wasn't just the apple falling from the tree. It helped quantify what motion was about. So, you know, gravity has been around forever. But we now seek to better understand it for the transfer of energy in the study of our art. So that's the science behind the art. So I thought, hmm, what can I, you know, what, what the heck is the name of my style? I'm going down this road and this is not what, you know, it's not what I learned. You know, it's not where I was told to go. I didn't exactly, uh, you know, uh, go to the place I was told. But because of this independent study, I ended up where I should be. So I said, okay, I got it. And I was thinking about this, uh, you know, this boom riodo. Uh, uh, it's called kotowaza in Japanese. In Japanese, we say kotowaza. Kotowaza wa. Uh, uh, means uh, proverb, a proverb. proverb. And uh, these types of proverbs, there's lots of proverbs, hundreds, maybe thousands. But this particular proverb is, uh, it, it's made out of four characters. And there's a certain um, way that the, the lexum is uh, interpreted in English. Anyway, uh, so Bumbrio uh, Do is Michi, the way, the Tao. And it means in order for us in the fighting arts, in order to be able to uh, truly uh, understand or master uh, this fighting art, and you have to, there has to be a balance in your training. You know, there, there needs to be a balance between not just the physical, but the, you know, the, the non-physical, the, I don't know, metaphysical or philosophical or scholarly or something like that. And, and what happens is when you don't have this, there's an imbalance. And usually it's a lot of, it's in the mind, you know, it's the, you see it in social behavior, you know, people are acting very rude or arrogant or, you know, they're very, um, like, bullies and, because they don't get it, you know, they, they feel, their insecurities feel threatened somehow by either a lack of knowledge or um, immaturity or something like that, and, and they act out in bad ways, they mislead, lie, you know. You know. So, 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 yeah. So, Koruchi Navi is not a not style. style. It's, uh, uh, some, some that, that night, uh, night. Uh, of course. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. So, let me conclude this story about Boom Riodo first and then ask me that, okay? Okay. So, so, uh, <laughs> So I, I was thinking, so you have a crest. I also have a crest. Too. I should send you one of these new ones here. Yeah, there you go. So um, uh, we're here, right? So um, I thought to myself, okay, there has to be this even balance between the physical and the non-physical. Hey, I got an idea. Why don't we use that as a sign, a signpost? Here's the pathway, and oh, there's a signpost. Oh, what, what does the signpost say? It says slow down. Oh, okay. Oh, here's another signpost. What does it say? Uh, speed up. Oh, okay. Uh, what's the signpost say? It says uh, train harder. Okay. Uh, what's it? Oh, there's another signpost up there. What's it say? It says uh, uh, be patient. Oh, okay. There, there's another <laughs> signpost. What does it say? This one says, you know, you're stupid. Oh, God, I'm stupid. Okay. I thought only my wife knows that. Okay. Okay. I'm stupid. And then the next one says, Oh, you're smart. Oh, somebody. Oh, that's two people. I'm smart. Oh, great. I, I, if I'm lucky, I can get a third person, you know. So a lot of signposts on the way. So I thought if there's a balance here, and, and it's very important to study the history and the philosophy, the anthropology, the culture, the language. There's so many things to study in addition to just the punching and mechanics and acts of violence. Okay, let's use that then as an icon 
for studying scholastic endeavors. And then I thought, oh yeah, I remember it. The in Nago, in Nago is in the north part of Okinawa. There used to be a guy back in the day. He was quite well known for his uh, uh, for uh, uh, as an educator, you know, uh, for helping young people, uh, you know, make that difficult transition from adolescence into adulthood, you know. And uh, and he liked the you know the fighting arts as a uh, mechanism as a tool to help uh, children evolve into young men, and so he used the you know Tay te, means the fighting arts, right? Tay. So, oh, oh, so they nicknamed him. Hey Tay, hey Tay. You know his name was T, T or Tay, and his uh, family name was Jun Soku, Jun Soku. So they called him Tay Jun Soku. And Tei Junsoku, 1684, wrote something that uh, has remained with us. I first learned it when I studied the works of uh, Nagamini Shoshin, uh, when I was uh, tasked with uh, translating his book into English, Tales of Okinawa's Great Masters. And in it, it says, uh, you know, and not just there, but it also says it in his other book as well, uh, Essence of Okinawa Karate, that it's not enough that, you know, you uh, practice the fighting art every day. But it must also be exampled in your daily behavior. And that's something about the body of moral philosophy that serves to govern the behavior of we like-minded people who come together. I mean, you know, put a gun in the, hand, in the hands of a, a person who's not too bright, uh, you got a dangerous weapon. And thinking of martial arts as a gun, you don't want to arm a person with a dangerous weapon who's got no brain, you know. So this, uh, this, uh, the, the first part, you, you notice these are just two things. The one pointing up is the same as the one pointing down. Yep. But the one pointing up for me, and remember, I, I, I had this brushed. I had a Zen monk brush this design for me. What's 1988? How, how many years ago is 1988? Uh, a lot of years ago. Uh, <laughs> 20. 42 years ago. 40, 40, yeah, 1988. Am I right? Am I right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 40, 42. So, for, so 42 years ago, I had the uh, uh, monk So Zen, who's actually Norwegian, by the way. Yeah, he, he became a ordained Zen monk. <clears throat> and that's another story for another time. Wonderful person. <laughs> a very great martial artist. So I, I so the so this first part is the fude. You know the fude saki. Fude saki. Fude saki means uh, the tip of a of a calligrapher's brush. And it symbolizes scholar. And the other part is the kisaki, the the tip of the samurai sword, the tip of the warrior's blade. So, so it's the pen and the sword in constant accord. And I thought, you know, I'm going to use that <laughs> to describe what it is I'm doing. Because, I, because I'm not, I'm not a big believer in styles anymore. You know, I was getting further and further and further away from. Me. You know, the style, if, I, if I'm part of that style, I'm not allowed to go over this style. You know, if I'm part of this school, I'm not allowed to go to that school. And, you know, if I'm part of this organization, I go to that organization, they think I'm doing some, you know, secret espionage work or something like that, and they kick me out or they get angry. And, you know, so I said, you know, and let me tell you, I, I was, uh, you know, uh, thinking about staying with a style, you know, let's, let, I call that being in line. Oh, where? Oh, I'll be right over. I'm just in line waiting for my, you know, my uh, my food or my, you know, at the bank. I'm in line. I'm, I'm in line. So th I'm, imagine I'm in line. I was a student with my master for many, many years, and I uh, was fortunate to train with many masters, you know. But by the time I got to the head of the line, I went like this. 
I'm in the wrong line. Yeah, I was in the wrong line. That's right. Because I, I, I don't want to be in a line where you cannot. I'm. You're not allowed to think that way. Hey, you're not allowed to use that. You're not allowed to practice that. Hey, well, what are you doing? I cut that from another style. You know, I, I just that wasn't me. So I, you know what I did? I'm starting my own line. That's what I'm doing. Oh, that's you're gonna get in trouble. <laughs> I, yeah, I've been in trouble ever since, believe me. I, I've been in trouble with everybody, you know, because I started my own line. Oh, is, is he Okinawan? Is he Japanese? Is he Chinese? Oh, maybe he's Korean, Southeast Asian. From Egypt. Oh, Mesopotamia. No, 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 he's a Canadian. <laughs> yep, he's just a nobody, he's a Canadian. Oh my goodness, how, <sighs> you know, and, uh, Everybody who uh, has always done well with the styles, they didn't like me. Okay. Because how dare I do something that all the other masters did, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Don't say that. Don't say, oh, Choki Motomu. Don't say that they all went and trained with everybody else. That's not allowed. You know, I'm making fun of somebody, right? So, oh, look at that, Christine. Hi, Christine. <laughs> I saw her name come up. Christine has just entered into our um, instructor training program. Okay, anyway, so let's go back to it. Let me, let me finish up because you asked me about the style, right? So the further I looked into the past, the further ahead into the future I could see. It's, is it sounds silly? It sounds silly. Oh, now he's a magician. <laughs> There's a rabbit. Here's a rabbit. You know, uh, so I thought, okay, I better just not say anything to anybody for a while because as I as I began to tell, oh, I can't. Oh, I just finished the translation of this document. I can't wait to share it with everybody. Oh, I just. Oh my God! Last week I met the, this guy who was a <clears throat> descendant of Sakugawa. Wow! I, I can't wait to tell everybody. Oh my God! I I went with the, the, the Okinawan master. We went to visit the the the, the daughter of Yabu Kensu and the, and the, oh my God! I met the 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 son of Miyagi Chojin. You know, oh I can't wait to tell everybody about it. And then I thought, uh oh, I better not say what the the son of Miyagi Chojin just said about his father. I, <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, I better not say that because, you know, that's not going to fit into the narrative that everybody's embracing, you know. Yes. He was, he's God and, uh, you know, he, he can do no wrong. And I went, oh, shit, if I say you know, what I just heard from so-and-so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to, you know, say, hey. And then in 1993, I still living in Japan. Uh, I do a lot of I'm do, doing a lot of writing. And, and remember, that's all kind of pre pre internet days and stuff like that. So uh, you know, I was actually writing articles and sending them off to magazine companies around the world. You know, I, I had a, a established a following of people in the, the United Kingdom, and uh, so uh, there was a magazine company called Fighting Arts International, uh, uh, headed up by a very senior uh, karate uh, practitioner named Terry O'Neill. And, and, and you know, we could do a whole encyclopedia just on that individual and the remarkable contributions that he's made uh, to the fighting arts and particularly karate through his, uh, through the platform uh, Fighting Arts International. That's another story. Anyway, he invited me out from Japan to teach my very first seminar ever. So on the one hand, I was a super excited. But on the other hand, I was uh, terribly uh, nervous. You know, in spite of uh, me living with this stuff every day and being totally excited and very passionate about it, I was going somewhere. You know, the Japanese culture is completely different from the Western culture, you know. That's that's a that's a good question. Ask me about that later. I'm happily. <laughs> no, no, really. It's a it's a it's a you know. A lot of people go to Japan and right away they fall in love with Japanese culture, 
and <clears throat> and then uh, you know they think, oh my God, I you know I I went to Japan, I I met the master, uh, the master, I met the master, and uh, he picked me up from the airport, and uh, he didn't let me pay for anything, and uh, he drove me around sightseeing. We I got the photograph with him, you know, uh, I got the certificate, and then I go back home, you know, and and uh, so they, for the rest of their lives. You know, they, they went to Okinawa for like, you know, five minutes. And they know everything about it. And uh, so, you know, then you get a guy like me comes along and describes, you know, uh, Japanese culture. Uh, yeah, and, you know, and uh, I'm quite, <laughs> these are not my ideas. It's like, you know, it's it's like these are, I'm quoting people like, uh, you know, Ruth Benedict, uh, uh, Edwin Reichauer, the American ambassador to Japan for 20 years uh, a long list of cultural anthropologists who've all talked about Japanese culture. You know, a uh, um, modern Japanese culture is built upon a thousand years of uh, of, uh, of uh, male-dominated, homogeneous, uh, extremely discriminatory culture of conformity in a Confucian-based mind thought. You know, so and the mechanisms that they use to keep uh, this uh, mind uh, set intact is a mechanism called the senpai kohai system. Imitative behavior, the trickle-down effect to perpetuate this mindset. It never changes. And uh, anyway, so that, that's a – and on top of this, I have what they call the tatemai honne. Uh, tatemai honne. So that, that, there's a great topic for another conversation, maybe another time. I'll tell you about the facade of the Japanese culture and the truth, uh, the difference of the two. And interestingly enough, when we talk about, uh, say, kata, for example, and we talk about uh, what you see on the surface is not what you get in the package. You know, the, the proverbial iceberg effect, right? Tatmai is what you see on the surface. And the honne is what you get under the surface, like we think, you know. So we say, you know, omote and ura. Omote, omote is the surface. The ura, the back. You know, the, what you cannot see from the surface is the back. Anyway, like I said, I jumped off the thing. We're talking about Koru Chunari, you see? And I said to you, okay, how did I come up with that name? Okay, so... Time out. In addition to uh, uh, karate and kobo, uh, I have a passion with swordsmanship. And somebody said, "Well, how long have you been practicing swordsmanship?" Oh, boys will get this. All boys will get this. How long have you been playing with swords for? Okay, I'm thinking. I don't even know how old I was when I was, uh, you know, in the forest. Breaking a branch off of a tree and you know fighting imaginary warriors through the forest, but I had to get home in time for dinner. You know, is that how far back you play with swords? It's you know, anyway. So a quick a quick side story, okay? <laughs> so it's April 29th, nineteen eighty eight. I mean, oh oh wow. How does he know the date? Because the date is the same every year. In Kyoto, uh, Kyoto, Japan, uh, at the Butoku Den, the big famous building, uh, which was built back in 1895 to, to put all the fighting arts in and to administrate the fighting arts back then. Um, the, there's an organization called Nippon Butoku. They have an annual festival. The festival is always on the old emperor's birthday, Hirohito, the old emperor. Uh, his birthday was in Yodinichi, you know, the 29th of April. So the 29th of April is always when they have the celebration, which leads into Golden Week, the first week of uh, uh, May. Okay. Anyway, I'm there. I'm doing a demonstration, and it's a great day. Uh, I, and I, I received this really nice award. Anyway, that's not the. the I'm. Um, now it's now it's in the afternoon. Now we did this in the morning. Now it's the afternoon, and now all the old guys are coming on to demonstrate their art. You know, spearmanship, swordsmanship, uh, archery. You know, all the old stuff, the koryu stuff. Koryu. Yeah, not again. Not the, not the modern stuff, but the old stuff. Koryu. It's called koryu. Anyway, uh, I remember in the morning I met that little old guy. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> they have to be careful what I say because, you know, but no, but people who don't know me then right away want to get insulted by what I say. Oh, he's being disrespectful. 
Well, you know, where's your sense of personality? For where's your sense of humor? I met this little old guy, beautiful, beautiful, a beautiful long kind of Chinese beard and a mustache, and and uh, you know, he almost looked like a Zorro, you know, a uh, ninety-five-year-old Zorro, you know. And, and, and uh, so, if I'm if I'm this tall, he was like over. He was like just uh, <laughs> close the camera. <laughs> he was like little, like this. He, he's very, very small. He used to tell people he's five foot tall, but I don't think, I think he was lying about his height. You know, I'm over six feet, and he, so he's one foot shorter than me. He had a nice three-piece suit on and a bow tie, and, and uh, you know, uh, he, he spoke uh, old-style Japanese, and he said, oh, I know, I know. You know, oh, Patrick McCarthy, your karate was pretty good, uh, but I know, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're very good, but you're, you're doing the wrong style. <laughs> and I uh, said, oh, thank you very much, uh, Sensei, thank you very much. I don't know who he is. Uh, and then, and then uh, in the afternoon, when we came back, the, then there's like a television crew and there's like a, Cameras and a lot of people, oh, yeah, yeah, like this. And, and there's like a 10 guys came in, they're all dressed up in the, you know, Yoroi, Yoroi, uh, Yoroi means uh, uh, Yoroi. Uh, armor, uh, samurai armor, you know, and they're swords and they, they look totally cool, you know, totally awesome. And I go, whoo, look at this. And, go, and, and they start fighting with each other. Now, this is not, this is not like what? Like, say, you know, Iaido, Iaido, get it. This is, this, this is not the eye. This is yes, like, ah, ah, ah. full blast, <laughs> screaming because EI is very, you know. You make no noise, you know. Oh, you know, I go and but these are yeah, fucking shooting. You know, hand biting the guy in the face and and biting him. I was going, what? what's this? <laughs> and I watched it for like five minutes, and I, I remember I said to my wife, I went, I went, because we lived up in Tokyo, and now we're down in Kyoto. It's like a three hours on the bullet train. Get down, you know, at a million miles an hour, it's three hours away, you know. It's like in another universe. Okay. But I said to my wife, I said, I think we're moving. <laughs> I, thought, <laughs> yeah, I thought that the, whatever this was, I wanted to do that. And I thought it was down here in Kyoto. And later I went, after the demonstration was over and the photographs and these were, you know, and he, oh, I went over to him, I said, wow. I said, you know, sensei, I'm going to be to be I said, wow, your, your demonstration was uh, fantastic. I'm so surprised, like, you know. And he went, ah. Would you like to practice my style? I'm, yeah, yeah. It's like a dog bone. <laughs> yes, please uh, let me, you know. And so he gave me his card. He said, okay, come to my dojo. So I took the card, you know, and I looked at the card. My, my Japanese was not great in those days, you know. And I looked at it, but I had to ask my wife because his card looked like it's a... Uh, a neighborhood right beside where I live in uh, near Tokyo. You know, I live in Kanagawa Prefecture, Fujisawa, and uh, um, uh, his uh, his business card said Kawasaki. That's like you know, it's like the next neighborhood over, okay. uh, a couple of neighborhoods, like thirty minutes from my house. Oh. And his name was his name was Sugino Yoshio. And he was the grandmaster of a sword style, samurai sword style, called Tenshin Shodin Katori Shinto Yu. And I just fell in love with it right away. The reason why I wanted to uh, share that with you was because um, the impact uh, that studying Katori Shinto Ryu had upon me for better understanding my karate Oh yeah! Hey, look at oh you, oh you've really done your research well. I took this video 
in at the Hain Shrine. That's my sensor right there. That's a, uh, and this, uh, what they're doing here, uh, these are called the Gogyo. These are called the kind of, uh, kind of secret little practices of swordsmanship. And, and you, by the way, Sensei here is in his 90s, 90s. Oh. And that's a Tori guy. He's uh, the guy who's practicing with this Tori guy. And uh, Tori guy has practiced all his life. In fact, when his mother was pregnant, uh, and she, she was one of Sugino's, uh, she was one of Sugino's uh, uh, disciples, uh, he was in her belly. So that's how long he's been practicing for. And uh, so you you can see that's uh, like uh, swordsmanship on uh, fire. <laughs> it's like it's an incredibly uh, wonderful stuff. So when I saw these two person drills, you know, the sword is attacking you a certain way. Uh, it's being received a certain way. It's wrapped up in an exercise that you can do slowly or you can do quickly. And and it becomes a wonderful template to culminate the individual lessons that you've already learned. I started thinking about, hmm, I don't see this in modern karate at all. And, you know, you keep in mind that uh, those people I told you who come up from Okinawa, they were the products of uh, a very... Um, embryotic period of time where there was a lot of transition going on. And uh, the uh, modern Japanese, uh, and you keep in mind that the, this was during a period of radical military escalation during which time um, the, uh, uh, the, the warrior arts were being used by the politicians of that uh, era to help distort the link between Zen and uh, their ancestors fighting arts. And a lot of propaganda was being pushed forward by the uh, those engines behind militarism, which were uh, using, uh, you know, you got to keep in mind there's no more samurai, right? And uh, so Japan was basically without a fighting force. So they used conscription to bring people into the military. And so, uh, you know, uh, no, war is a, a terrible thing. And it's brutally, you know, there's nothing pretty about war. And so, uh, so they were using propaganda like, man, you know, be a man among men. Or join the military. Uh, practicing the fighting arts will allow you to walk in the footsteps of your samurai brothers. They were the samurai brothers. Uh, you know, the samurai was a, uh, you had to be born into it, you know. It was the, when I say hugely discriminatory, I mean, you know, there are classes of human beings. And you, if you think that that's gone away, you don't understand Japanese culture, believe me. But anyway, but the ones who went for five minutes, they know it better than me. And so the problem here was then, uh, the authorities of that era were using uh, historical uh, understanding uh, distorted and wrapped up in a uh, propaganda campaign to bring people into the military. Uh, Judo and Kendo were the classical um, mechanisms used in the school system because Boot camp wasn't getting you in shape. Uh, yeah, oh, oh, what's the movie? Uh, the Tom Cruise movie. Okay, look, it's a Hollywood movie, but uh, you know it served its purpose with regards to uh, you know um, explaining why Japan was reaching out and bringing foreign influence into help them with their military and so on and so forth. And uh, and then it was uh, actually actually uh, some reason to believe that it was a German. Uh, who was a, a doctor, uh, actually he was the physician uh, to the Taisho Emperor, uh, whose name was Irvin von Beetz, and, uh, and you know, he uh, was a professor of medicine at Tokyo University at the same time, and he, he you know, there's some reason for us to believe that he had a role in, in, in saying, look, you know, in, in German you know, and the German culture has a lot of similarities. And that's beside the point that, you know, they signed the Traxxas Treaty with the 
the Nazis, uh, the, the fascists, and the imperialists. That's, a, that's beside the point. But there's a lot of similarities in German culture. And, the, the, and Bill said, uh, you know, in, uh, in German culture, what we do is we, have, we put wrestling into the school system, you know, because it keeps you healthy and fit. And we also have swordsmanship as well, which, uh, you know, teaches us the uh, uh, tenets of how to be a gentleman and, you know, how to resolve uh, personal uh, disputes and so on. And so uh, isn't it interesting that just around that time in history, uh, 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 there was a revision of the old schools of jiu-jitsu uh, headed up by uh, an another educator named Kano Jiuro-sensei. Uh, who 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 saw uh, this uh, practice as a mechanism through which to funnel uh, physical fitness and social conformity? It, you know, and he, and he spoke a couple of languages, a very international personality, uh, an aristocrat on top of that, and a member of the International Olympic Committee, uh, long before everybody else. So he had this guy kind of wonderful vision. And at the same time, we we see the uh, swordsmanship coming together. You know, all kinds of different schools of swordsmanship coming together into a fusion, an embryonic fusion, to create a tradition which basically brought together four strikes. Uh, uh, ski, you know, ski, uh, thrust, uh, men, you know, hit you in the head, uh, dole, cut your body in half, and kote, to, you know, uh, defang the snake, so to speak, you know, so you couldn't hold a sword. Four strikes. You learn, uh, you know, sabaki, how to move. And uh, then you know, uh, and then you uh, you can fight with each other with armor. It was great thing, you know. And they use these two mechanisms in the school system, which, by the way, just gives you a entry point into around a little bit a little bit later, around the turn of the century, when you get a guy like Ito's uncle in Okinawa, who uh, and you know Okinawa is a terribly dilapidated economy in that era. Yeah. That's an, and there's room for another conversation, by the way. But, uh, who, you know, said, Look, you know, we could, you know, I can take, I can take this same idea that Bayless had, you know, about, you know, because you know, in karate, your hands and feet are like spears and swords. <clears throat> you know, if we can condition the body, cultivate the mind, and nurture the fighting spirit, we can contribute to the Japanese uh, overall program, and it would be a great contribution. On behalf of we modest people in Okinawa, and uh, and uh, push came to shove, and there were a lot of people behind it also, by the way. But uh, yeah, and so he succeeded in taking a very modified version of an older practice and putting it into the school system to create uh, something similar to kendo and judo. Okay, anyway, so I have not forgotten where we are, uh, and that is talking <laughs> about cold uchinari. So I'm going to explain it now. So, <clears throat> in my mind, I now know that koryu is a term that was uh, popularized in uh, modern times. Not, it wasn't around back in the Meiji period. Koryu. I practice koryu because that was old times, right? <laughs> and we have a uh, one of my one of my teachers, uh, Richard Kim, student of Kinja Hiroshi, uh, back in the 1970s said to me, he said, you know, um, and by the way, Richard Kim was a real boom boo person as well, you know, very much so. He was the first person who compelled us to look into the pages of historical uh, transcripts to better understand uh, the nature of what it was we practice. Study the old, understand the new. On Ko Chi Shi was where I first got that from Richard Kim. Anyway, and in that pursuit, uh, I, uh, Came across the name Don Dreger. I had no idea who he was, and but uh, you know, for uh, for a small amount of money, you could join his uh, organization and get the newsletter. And so I, I did, and I used to get the newsletters on, uh, you know, what he was most involved with. And he he'd written a few books, you know, uh, but what Dreger was, and Dreger was, uh, by the way, just as a short uh, capsule biography, Dreger was an American. Uh, uh, a uh, fighting marine fought in the jungles of Southeast Asia in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the with, with the Japanese, and and who rather than hating them, 
totally respected their mentality of warriorship. And uh, in the post-war years, he, he went to Japan and learned how to speak the language and uh, study and practice a uh, Jo and Sokato Shintoru and some karate. And, and he was the person who many of us now who study the anthropology of our tradition look to as the kind of the father, the pioneer of uh, the Western approach to studying the fighting art of Japan. And, uh, and look, he was not the first. There are people before him in several different companies. Jay Harrison was another, uh, Bayless is another guy, and you know, eat, uh, um, Eugene Harrigal. There's, there's, there's a lot of other people, but, but for me, uh, Dreger was a guy who, who helped define and catalog or cate categorize. You know, there's old fighting arts uh, from before the Meiji period, you know, that from actually, actually historically, up to the Battle of Sekigahara, which is around 1600. You know, that's the warring states. Those are the old schools. Now, now kept alive as this pathway of practice where you, you know, where you are now the warriors without a war are now fusing the practice with the saddle and, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, you know, with uh, uh, tea ceremony and calligraphy and poetry and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, flower arrangement and, and no and, you know, all kinds of other pathways to fusion. To, to you know, make the art and science come together. Those are cold you. Those are the old schools. And then, of course, you know, around in, in the you know, uh, you know, when the Japan is dragged out from the uh, dark ages of feudalism, if you want to catalog it that way, that's another thing. Anyway, and, uh, and then and then there's new there's new martial arts. You know the you know so, so there's a kind of a gendai. You know. A, it's not Koru, it's, it's, it's a Shin, mar, new martial arts, you know. It's, it's a, not the Bougay, it's the Budo, you know. And um, and then, of course, and then, and then it's the post-war look at the fighting arts uh, as a uh, cultural recreation, you know, a life uh, training tradition, you know. And, and that's a, a, perhaps a topic for another conversation. But I just want to catalog this to show you now in modern times, when people think of uh, you know, oh karate, that's a well, let me see, uh, that was uh, ratified in December of 1933 uh, after the Dainipon Butokukai set forth uh, six sets of criteria for the haphazard uh, Okinawan movement to join and you know uh, cover that body up and put a uniform on it, get rid of those sashes and put the, use use Kano's belt system and the Dan Q and the, have a method of testing the veracity. You know, all the, all these things came together. Uh, December 1933, Dainapampa Tokai ratifies brand new tradition. There's Judo, Kendo, Naginata, Sumo, Shorjika, and Kana Kana. Yeah, so so that's the, that that's new karate. Okay, I don't do that karate, by the way. That's that's not what I do, by the way. And so I had this vision about you know study the old, better understand the new, and I I like the old. I, I I haven't created anything new at all. That, that would be that's an insult to all the people who came before me. If somebody out there thinks that I created something new, they're wrong, or they're listening to people who are wrong. And I, that's not me. What I did was, uh, I, I think, in terms of ro Rodan, you know, I haven't created anything beautiful. I just merely uh, was able to find the right stone, move, move away the rubble, and see the beauty inside. This stuff has always, always existed, always. And it was the product of uh, a very long possession of uh, empirical observation. Empirical observation is a fancy term we use in, uh, in science to describe the ongoing results of hands-on study in a... Um, A methodical, progressive fashion of studying that which there is to understand to arrive at a more innovative way of doing the same thing. And there's a great quote by one of my favorite uh, anthropologists, Joseph Campbell, who said, 
But every generation produces uh, uh, innovators who, in an effort to keep their traditions a living experience for the community it serves, uh, find a reason to reinterpret the common principles upon which it rests. And in doing so, in spite of the uh, lip service to lines better than theirs, it's just a more innovative way of doing the very same thing. So, I, my uh, former jujitsu instructor was Professor Wally Jay. And Professor Jay used to have a great quote. He'd say, why, why, would, you, why would you want to fight World War III with World War II weapons? You know, and, and, and the, the, the sentiment here was if, if, if the world is progressing and you're going to be left behind and then you expect to be uh, remain functional in a world that has changed. And remember that, that that's what scientific analysis does. Scientific analysis ensures that there's a continual process of improvement, supposedly. And, 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 and if you, you can better understand something now compared to how it was, wouldn't you want to be able to do that? And that's not to say that you're disrespecting the legacy of the pioneers' heritage who put down their, themselves so that others could learn. This is merely saying, I, want, I, I, I love the history, I love the culture, I love the language. I love the lifestyle. I want to be, I want to embrace something from the womb to the tomb that can be a pathway to condition my body, cultivate my mind, nurture my spirit, and keep me functional. That's what Kodyu Uchinari is. It's a body of practices which have been Rediscovered, if modern karate has seemed to overshadowed that history, and because of Japanese culture and its Confucian-based mindset of not questioning, not using this out-of-the-box mentality, this critical thinking process to keep the reservoir fresh, these practices in many ways have become static, become overly ritualized. And, you know, of course, I just in my mind, I had a, a thought just jump in. Well, what about so-and-so is the world champion? <laughs> no, there's always, there's always, you know, I, I, I say there's this line, this spectrum. And at one end of the spectrum, you've got the super... Athletes. I, I don't care what culture, what time, what you know, race they are. These are people who can do anything, and they can do it in in one year or two years. They just they they. they and you probably have students like that too. You say, "How did that guy learn how to do that?" I just taught him like the other day. <laughs> it happened. Okay, so forget those people for a minute. At the other end of the spectrum, and God love them. <laughs> You know, because they're usually such very nice people. Uh, they never get it. It's never. And they never get it. So I love them. They continue to practice for the rest of their life. But then somewhere in the middle, you have the average people. And the average people, thank God, through the law of reciprocity, you know, you get back what you put in. And Funagoshi Sensei reminded us that this putting in and getting back is like boiling water. <laughs> you, know, you take the fire away, the water gets cold. You know, I'm an I'm example right now. Four and a half months of uh, isolation. <laughs> you know, I'm, my water is cold, man. So you know, so you always have to keep it alive. You have to keep the practice going. And you know, somewhere along the line, you know, it becomes evident I'm not the best. I'm never going to be the best. And I don't even care if I'm the best. I'm not doing it to be the best. 
I'm doing it because it makes me feel alive. Practicing this art in its many derivations allows me to feel in touch with nature, in touch with my inner self. And that's enough. That's enough. And especially now, you know, it's I I I don't mean to I don't mean to laugh at them, but you know, it's funny now, you know, all the uh jujitsu guys and the wrestlers and the, you know who you know laughed at oh kata, what a what shit is that? You know, the very disrespectful opinion of solo practices. I guess not anymore, right? I guess people now are thinking, oh my goodness, karate, wow. <laughs> karate is great during COVID the pandemic. <laughs> I can do all the solo representations by myself, and I can have this wonderful, you know, uh, uh, application going on in, in my mind with these imaginary fighters. And uh, that's one of the special things about kata. So uh, let me finish off, take the time out, and I'll go back, and let me finish off about the Kodu Utsinari. So 1993, I'm over in England teaching what I do, and everybody was going, oh, my God, what, what is this stuff? Never seen anything like And by the way, my, uh, you know, the detractors, and I have no shortage of those. The detractors, this is not karate. That's not karate. That's not karate. Karate. <laughs> karate. That's not karate. <laughs> not karate my That's something else. And, and they told me for years, this is not karate. That's not karate. That McCarthy made that shit up. It's not karate. And I kept saying, but it, it actually is karate. It, excuse me, it's just a karate from a time that you're not familiar with. It's just a karate before the modernization process. It's just, a, it's just karate from a period of time before someone got an idea to modify its practice, put it into the school system. Focus on one thing, kata, as a mechanism for physical fitness and social conformity to prepare young students as conscripts to go and fight in the war. And, uh, you know, some people got that, others don't. The funny part in my in our organization about that is that those uh, members who are old enough to remember this will remember that a lot of the most um, vocal detractors of mine back in the 90s Oh, that that's bullshit, and uh, there's no such thing as two-person drills, and uh, ah, he's full of shit, McCarthy. They now are being congratulated for teaching what they criticized me for <laughs> 30 years ago. <clears throat> so interesting, uh, but I'm not allowed to say that because that you know that helps. That uh, that tends once again to threaten the insecurity of people who know. Uh, the impact I had upon uh, what one person can do uh, in the overall practices of our tradition. So anyway, so in those days, people said, what, what is this style you're teaching? What We want some of that. Give me some more Kool-Aid. Bring the Kool-Aid. <clears throat> I said, uh, oh, it's, um, yeah, there is, it's not exactly a style. It's just, uh, you know, uh, like if you were alive 150 years ago or 20 years ago, you know, uh, you had to learn because because somebody can grab you, you have to learn how to escape from being grabbed. Or if you want to grab somebody to settle them down, you need to learn how to grab them so they can escape. So there's escapes and there's counters and and or you know if you hit somebody, it's better it's better rather than use your fingers to stick him in the eye so he's blind for the rest of his life. Learn how to clench your fist, hit him, and 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 you don't kill him. So uh, so there's, there's there's all of these things to learn. So some of those are about capturing and controlling. Others are about percussive impact. Some of them are about fighting on the ground. <laughs> fighting on the ground. So, so when I discovered Tegumi, for example, you know, I was working on the translation in the late 1990s for uh, Nagamini Shoshin. And, uh, and you know, over the, you know, I've been going to Okinawa since the mid-1980s, right? But, and I always used to hear about, you know, uh, grappling and wrestling and, you know, I looked it up and I saw that there's a historical reference to a guy named Tamitomo. Tamitomo was one of the sons of uh, Minamoto Yoritomo uh, back in the 
old days, before, even before the birth of the samurai. They were called bushi back in those days, before the, uh, before the Taira Minamoto battle. Okay? Anyway. And uh, anyway, uh, he, uh, in this one of these skirmishes, he was taken prisoner. He and his men, and they were imprisoned uh, down at Izu uh, Peninsula, uh, not so far from where I used to live, actually, in, in Kanagawa Prefecture. And uh, anyway, anyway, long story short is uh, they over they overcame uh, the, the garrison guards and they snuck on the back and they grabbed a boat, a ship, a ship, and they commandeered a ship and they sailed it off. These are great warriors and apparently terrible sailors. <laughs> And they, <laughs> so the winds blew them south. Anyway, they they wound up in Okinawa. That that's the little story about how Tom made how a how a uh, bushy warrior winds up in Okinawa. And there's some reason to believe that during that time frame, you know, you learn the sword, you learn horsemanship, you learn arrows. And Tom Tomo was famous for the archery, by the way. Uh, but also on the battlefield, you know, if you broke your sword or you couldn't pull your sword out of a body or whatever. And, and somebody's coming at you, you know, you, you, you have to learn how to, you know, you get in, grab them, throw them down, pull out your sword and stab them or something like that. So, so this idea of clinch, grapple, fight on the ground was part and parcel of a Heian period. That's how far back it goes, uh, grappling, wrestling. And so this evolved over the many generations in Okinawa to become known as Muto, uh, sorry, Muto. In around the castle area, in another part, uh, you know, uh, you know, Tomari, Shui, Naha, Yomitan, Motobu, Chinen, there's lots of different parts of Okinawa. But I mean, the whole island is only like 100 kilometers long. So it's not exactly a big place, you know. It became known as Tegumi Te, and Gumi means to, you know, blow up. it's like crossing swords, got to cross swords. And, and when I was reading that, I thought, I said, oh, gosh, look, hmm. I, I, um, I discovered a grammatical error in Nagamini Shoshin's book. So I oh, God. And, you know, and, and then I was uh, talking to Nagamini Sensei literally every day and seeing him two, once or twice a month anyway. And so I'd say, <clears throat> もしもしはい何でしょうかあの何でもいいですよ先生よろしくお願いしますよはいはい僕ですがあ先生すいませんおそらくあそこのすいませんけどはい何でしょうかあのちょっとあ先生そうそうそうそうそうそうそうそうそ
よくわからないですけどもね、よくおっしゃるな。Like, what? What? He said, you, you don't know what I want. No, what? えっと、ケグミについて、you know, about, about,、uh, ケグミなの。Uh, it's not a mistake. あ、ダメだよ。No, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's wrestling. It's, it's our old school of wrestling. Wrestling. Oh. And he said to me, he goes, he goes, you know, I used to be part of the snake pit、uh, gym in、uh, Tokyo. We were the shoot fighters, you know,、um, submission wrestlers. And、uh, in the old days, we used to call ourselves UWFI. And then our boss, our head guy, Takara Nobuhiko, he changed the name to Pride. We, we, became, we were the Pride fighters back in the old days for mixed martial arts, you know. So he, he said to me, Nagamini sensei said, and, and, and、uh, by the way, the generic term for this in Japan is called kakutogi. Kakutogi, kakutogi, kakutogi. It means combat arts, right? And so he goes, Ano, Papu, Tegumi, Tegumi ni tsuite, about Tegumi. Ito, Ano, Kurabite, compared to kakutogi, Toto ni tsuru desu ke domo. So,、uh, comparing、uh, Tegumi to Kaktogi, it's kind of similar, he said. It's about the clinching, you know, and in the old days, you know, hit the fucking head bottom, <coughs> throw him down on the ground, you know, and that's in the old days. But he said, in the new days, you know, around the turn of the century, it became a little bit of a kind of a passageway, a rite of a ritually, ritualized passageway for kids, you know, to, kind of like Okinawan sumo, you know. No, nobody was hurting each other anymore. It was just you reach in, grab each other, and you throw the person down. And so I said, Oh my God. So there's, so there's, a, you know, we have a lot. We have an impact, we have a seizing, and we have, so there's stand up, there's clinching, and there's ground fighting in karate. And I said, Oh, yeah, wow. Okay. Don't tell anybody else, you know. And, and so I got, So, when I say, you know, that, that's how I first came up with the term, you know. And you got to remember in those days, I was doing a lot of traveling. You know, I was、uh, back in Japan there. I was, you know, traveling to Taiwan, Hong Kong, Korea, Southeast Asia, China, Shaolin Temple, Fujian. You know, I'll go in many places to study、uh, the origins、uh, and the progenitor sources of influence, which helped uh, uh, shape. The old school practices in Okinawa, because at one time you had several different practices、uh, for empty handed. I, I'm, I'm leaving the weapons off to the side.、Okay? Uh, different forms of empty handed. You had the grappling, you had the, you had the impact, you had the seizing, you had the joint and the strangles and all those. Those are all separate. So when I was describing to people what it is that I was doing, I was telling them it's this, it's this old school practices. That's what I'm teaching at my seminars. And, and I was the first person to start using this term, tegumi, because I figured, okay, <clears throat> like nobody else is using it. I found it in an old book. Nobody's using it. And I got a lot of these, I, I collected a lot of drills from many sources, which I was able to link back to a cosmetic representation. In cosmetic, it looks the same. The solo representation in kata, you know, one, two, three, look like checking, trapping, and impact. Check, trap, you know, oh, it looks like a hubad from,、uh, you know,、uh, Southeast Asia, Sil- Silat,、uh, Kuntao Pukalon, Jimmy、uh, Kali, Screamer, you know, there's Wing Chun, Do Pai, Long Yin, Bat Mei, Do Ne, there's lots of stuff, you know. Uh, southern styles, I was seeing these things everywhere. The only thing I wasn't seeing was、uh, it practicing karate. And so I was saying, that's what I, I'm teaching you. These are old, old practices. Yeah, but, but what's the name of the style? And I go, oh, okay, there's,、uh, there's, there's no name to the style. It's just, it's before styles became trendy, you know. Yeah, yeah, okay, well, yeah, yeah. Okay, but, but what's the name of the style? And I go, <laughs> <laughs> Hello, hello. There's an echo. You know, I said, 
I said, the, it, it's just old style. Okay, man, there's a, I want to, you're hiding, you're hiding the name of the style from me. And we're going to find out sooner or later, what's the name of this style? Okay, so anyway, over the next one or two years, oh, I was being invited everywhere to teach, you know, Russia, uh, America, Canada, uh, you know, uh, Australia, New Zealand, you know. Now, to tell you the truth, I was, I mean, come on, I was like, oh, <clears throat> this is good. I'm getting paid money to go and do something that I, I, I would do it for free anyway. <laughs> <laughs> They're paying me to do it, I, and I'm going on an airplane and, uh, you know, having a cerveza and, you know, uh, meeting lots of uh, really cool people uh, who all love what we're doing. So everywhere I go, it's like old home week. I'm with people who automatically, it's like they're day, you know, in Okinawa. Once we meet, even if it's only for five minutes, we're brothers, you know. And I, how can you not love that? And so I got, I got so caught up in the loving it part, uh, but I, I forgot about uh, it had to be a style. So I remember talking to my teacher, uh, Kinjo Sensei. Hey, Mush Mush Sensei. <laughs> I got a problem. Can you help me with it? He goes, I want to, I don't, yeah, well, karate needs to take, yeah, but it's about the karate, you know. Okay, what is it? Well, you know, every time I go to teach something, everybody wants to know what the heck is my style. <laughs> and I can't tell them that it's, you know, Shore and Rue, which is where I come from. I'm a, I'm a, my, by, by the way, my background's in Shore and right? I, I can't say I'm from Shore and Rue because uh, if you go to Shore and Rue, they're not doing that, you know. And if I said, if I said, yes, I'm, I'm Shore and Rue. No, he's not. That's not true. No, no. That's right. So I said, all right. And sensei, sensei said to me, he goes, why don't you just tell him what it is? I said, well, I am telling him what it is, but then I'll get it. Oh, yes, he said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said that. He said, he said foreign people, you know, foreign people like gaijin, like non-Japanese people. Yeah, foreign people, he said, they like, uh, they like, Japanese words, you know, they like gotta give them a Japanese word. I'm like, okay, uh, like word should I give? Well, you know, back in the day, back in the old days, we we, uh, we Okinawan people, we used to uh, be known as Uchinanshu. I said, what? What's that? The Uchinanshu. And I remember. A couple of years earlier, I went to Okinawa uh, to go to the first ever Uchinanchu festival. It was held over the Inawan Sports Center. It was big, massive uh, people, Okinawan people from all over the world, South America, everywhere came together to celebrate. And that's another reason for a great conversation because around 1992 was when uh, the 20-year expiration date, when uh, the Americans were supposed to give up and get out of Okinawa, by the way. And a lot of money was funneled into Okinawa Prefecture to build the rebuild the castle and build a big, huge studio set, which was called Duke uh, no Kaze. Uh, and it was a 42-part uh, drama television series uh, about the Rukyu Kingdom. Uh, talked about Yana Oyakata. And, uh, that's a, another conversation, okay? But he said, so 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 we we call ourselves Uchina, you know, inside people. Inside people. And um and so 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 Okinawa, you know, uh we can say Uchina means the same thing. Uchina. Uchina mean Okinawa. And I said, okay, uh, and he said he said back in the old days, we didn't use the word karate. We did kara is a prefix to be written like China, you know. Yeah. And there's a long story. That's a reason for another conversation. But, you know, there was no, there was, uh, you know, uh, back in the day with the white party and the black party, uh, anti, anti-Chinese, anti uh, pro-Japanese, you know, people, people went missing, never came back again, you know. So, so, so you know, uh, that's another story for Kano Jigoro visiting Okinawa in January 1927. I'll tell you the story another time about how the ancient art of Tomorite, Shirte, and Naote were developed in 1926, but that, let's see. And so, so the word T or T or D, 
wie das ist pronounced in Okinawa, Okinawa, Uchinago is pronounced. So he said, call it Utina D. Utina D. And I went, yeah, that's, yeah, that's. And, and it was especially good because nobody else was using it at the time. Went, yeah, okay. And he said, but he said, uh, he said, you know, what kind of Uchinadi are you teaching? I went, well, we're, we're teaching, he says, are you teaching the stuff from December of 1933? <clears throat> you know, the 3K karate, you know, Kihon, uh, Katakumite. And I went, eh, no, 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 no. Because Kihon Waza is another modern development. A lot of people think Kihon comes from 200 years ago. No, Kihon Waza was developed in the 1920s and 30s by guys like Otsuka Hironori and uh, Konishi Asahiro. These are the guys who put karate uh, into the Butoko Kai to get its acceptance, by the way. Not, not, the, not, the, not the Okinawa, by the way. You know. and, and they snuck in through the back door to the judo department. That's another conversation for another time. And anybody who studies the history, they know that. It's only the people who don't study the history, they don't know it. And so, anyway, so... Um, so I said, oh, yeah, okay. So I'm not doing, I'm not doing, we're not doing modern stuff. So I can't say, okay. I'm, he said, well, you know, you're doing the old school, right? I said, yeah. He said, so call it old school. Old school karate, old school uchinari. And I went, okay. So what do I say? Uh, furu, furu gakko uchinari. And he went, ha, no. <laughs> furu, furu means old. Like furui, you know. Uh, uh, and Gakko uh, means school, old school. So I thought, yeah, okay, I'm doing Furu Gaku Uchinadi. Anyway, <laughs> Baka, he used to call me Baka. Anyway, you fool, you know, you, you idiot. Nice, no, nice. He says, no, you can use a Furu Gaku, it's no good. So I started playing around the kanjis. I go, oh, okay, here's how you write old, uh, uh, you know, uh. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. That's all. All. Furu. Ah. Onyomi, kunyomi. Uh, Chinese pronunciation, Japanese pronunciation. Ah. Ko. Ko means like kobudo. Ko. Kobudo. Old uh, fighting arts. Old martial arts. Oh, okay. Ko. Okay. Ko. I'm doing ko. Gako. Uchinari. Ko. Gako. Ko. Gako. Nah, nah, Danza Sensei said, nah, 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 you're laughing. I said, oh, yeah, okay, because the Tay, Tay, Tay is the, is the actual fighting art itself. <coughs> and there's Chinese Tay, empty Tay, so there's a lot of Tay, so Karate, so, okay. And Karate, remember, that's a new term, right? So I don't want to use the new term, so I go, I got it. And there's, and there's, remember, uh, there's a, there's two ways to pronounce uh, Japanese characters, which are really Chinese characters. But so there's the Chinese way to pronounce it, and there's the Japanese way to pronounce. It. Just as a matter of interest, for example, uh, Mabuni Kema, who was a pioneer of Shitoryu Karate, when he wanted to uh, honor uh, his teachers who empowered him to teach this beautiful art of Shitoryu Karate. He said, I'm going to call my art the Itosu and the Higoona art. Yeah. What art do you teach? I teach uh, Mabuni Higoona art. That makes sense. So he took the character, the first character from each of their names, and he used the alternative pronunciation. So Itosu, Itosu, Ito, we pronounce hmm, she. she. And she, she, he, she, she is the sound that you hear when it's pronounced. And and uh, higa ona, the, the ideogram from higa or higashi ona means east, like east, like east to China, east, right? And it's pronounced higa or higashi. But the alternative pronunciation is to. So you can say chi to. And ryu means stream or pathway from which it flows down. So he said, she told you. So I said, that's, that's the, I, so that I get the idea. I can use the alternative pronunciation for Tay. I got it. 
which is shu. Uh, by the way, you know the in in Korea they have tang shu do, tang su do. Su means hand, like tay. So I said, oh, I got it. Ko ryu shu. That's it. I got it. Fantastic. Ko ryu shu uchinari. That's what I'm doing. So I. Mushu mushu. Sensei, see my book desk. I'm like, ha, arimasu yo. Just, hey, sensei, me, I got it. I, I got it. Nanshoka. Ko ryu shu uchinari desu ke domo. And I. Oh my gosh, you don't know how to make this get domo. Yeah, I'm okay. They got nothing in your brain. You're so stupid. You know what I mean? What's wrong? He said, Koru Shu. <laughs> I said, why are you laughing? He said, sounds like an old bottle of wine or something. You know, like a, you know, uh, uh, Shu is like, uh, like, you know, uh, if you drink sake or uh, uh, awamori or something, it's, it's Shu. Right? He said, nah, it sounds like you're drinking an old bottle of wine. He said, that's no good. He said, just call it what it is. It's Koru Uchinari. That's what it is. Koru Uchinari. That's a good idea. Yeah, I got this epiphany, you know, like, oh, blinding flash of the obvious. You know, you know, uh, hindsight is better than foresight. And right away, I went, oh, that's good. Okay. He said, you know, you don't want to, you're not teaching a style, you're teaching a body of systematized practices. You, you, because of your research as a Kenkyu uh, you went and you, you looked into the, you know, under the rocks and in the nooks and cranny, and you 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 were able to find things that uh, meant something to you, if, because they meant something else to somebody else. And if somebody else would have got them, then they would have been teaching it before you. So you you found it, you tried and erred it, and no, that's no good. I think this this this, and you were able to shape it together over a period of a few years into a coherent system. You, 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 you were able to quantify, oh, we don't need this, I do this and this and that. And then, you, then, you, and then I stumble over the habitual acts of physical violence theory. And because of my Katori Shito Ru and the two person, you know, Uke Tori back and forth, I, you know, I thought, we gotta put them together. And the better you are, the more aggressive resistance you need until you, the end result is just functionality. You know, oh, I'm going to give you a black belt. That, that belt means nothing, you know. I love what the Helio Gracie said, you know. Black belt covers two inches of your ass. You better hope that your training covers the other part of it, you know. So, so I figured, okay, let's focus our attention on the practices itself. And then I said, oh, my God, I got it. The two-person practices, that is the art. That's the art. That's the fighting art. The solo representation is the is the art is the creative art form that comes after the two person drills. So if you take the two person drills, and let's let's just take one drill from it. We we'll, we'll take uh, let me see. Let's just take one drill, one act of violence, and just pretend. Just go with me, okay? Just yeah. pretend in the whole world, there's only one act of violence. Uh, let's call it a headlock. Uh, you know, head Once you understand the dynamics of the headlock, now you can understand why it's so dangerous. And, and by understanding and uh, quantifying the dynamics of the headlock, its mechanism, you now know uh, what makes it strong, and therefore you can better explore develop, invent, create, extrapolate, interpolate, however you want to call it, through empirical observation and constant practice, how to escape from it. And then you can practice it very uh, gently first and then aggressively later to find out, oh, if you don't do this, that will happen. And if you do this, maybe that will happen. That's my, that's my Sensei Murphy. What will happen and can go wrong, it will. So you have to remember that is the test of the functionality until you become functionally competent. So, so now, after you have done this for a week, a month, a year, two years, whatever, 
you now you now can separate the two people, the attacker and the defender. And now you can ritualize the defensive theme into a conceptual solo representation. So if you take the solo representation of the headlock and link it together with solo representations of other acts of bear hugs, hair pull, chokes, to, on the ground, in the clinch, standing up, and then you link them together into a subjective yet creative routine, the end result is something greater than the sum total of its individual parts. And that, my friend, is what kata is. So I introduced it. Everybody, here's a system of functional practices which link defensive themes to functional applications which provide the foundation from which to understand kata. It's called Kodyu Uchinari, old school karate. I've never heard of that before. <laughs> you fucking made that up. <laughs> you know what I mean? So as soon as I put the name on it, it started all over again. And to this day, all those people who practice koru arts, you know, Yagyu, Shinkagiru, Katori Shintaru, and a long list of uh, koru arts, they, they think I'm the devil, you know, for using their, <laughs> you know, the name that Don Trigger, you know, thought, uh, you know, put on top of uh, describing. So because, you know, McCarthy, you know, there's no lineage coming down from the old days to prove that this is uh, 300 years old. And I'm like, okay, you know something? And I, I spent years and years studying the history, anthropology, culture, the pioneers, who uh, taught them what was their influence, how did they contribute back, and so on, that after a while, I wasn't so, I wasn't as, I wasn't as motivated to discover, oh, what, what was his name? I, I've got to find out his name. And then by finding out his name, um, I'm going to then, oh, then I can find out his date of birth, his date of death, who taught him, uh, uh, who, was, who he influenced, and I can add another piece of the puzzle. You know, after I, uh, you know, stumbled across the habitual act of physical violence theory, and I understand the process by which functionality uh, became a means, uh, I was less and less interested in knowing what the guy's name was. Because it didn't matter if his name was Joe, or Manuel, or Paco, or Patrick, or Miyamoto. And it didn't matter that he lived in the 14th century or he was a monk, a warrior monk at the Shaolin Temple, or he was one of the guys that Chiang Kai-shek chased out of uh, Henan province. It, it didn't matter. What mattered was you had a, you had a, you know, pathology, neck, head, arms, path uh, neurology, muscular structure, you know, and limbs, and they could do things. And, and I started placing more attention into what is humanly possible. Uh, how can it be addressed rationally? Uh, how can it be studied from a pedagogical um, perspective? How can we understand its science, mechanics? And how, how do we understand uh, how to make it work better? And how, how do we not only make it work, work better now, like you, I know you're young and strong, and, and, uh, and I'm not young and strong anymore, and, and I, I'm not going to be able to do what you can do just based upon age and physicality alone. And then how about when I'm really old, or, or how about when he's really young, or how about when he's sick or old or a female or a child or a challenged learner? How, you know, see, the act of physical violence, it's not going to change. But you're going to change. So there was a lot of things in play that I needed to uh, learn how to quantify, and, and and not a lot of people were on board with me. Um, they saw what I was doing as highly disrespectful to uh, 
uh, age old traditions. And it, it didn't matter how long, it didn't matter how much I tried to convince them that I wasn't. I was actually really, and prob I'm probably, probably more respectful now of now that I better understand what tradition really represents. You know, and, and you know, getting in line and shutting your mouth and being a, a you know, somebody who doesn't challenge the status quo. That's not my idea. Uh, oh, so maybe on a perfect world, that might be good. But I discovered that they weren't perfect. And these people who are, you know, that we, we, we Westerners tend to put up on pedestals, you know, who smoke and drink. Ah! And I found, my God, hey, well, they're, they're just normal like us, you know. Oh, my God. Capable of fouls, you know, making mistakes and not understanding it. You know, so I, I used to listen to guys, you know, masters. I won't say names, but, you know, tell me ridiculous stories about this. This is for that. And, uh, you know, the guy, uh, you know, the Okinawan is in the rice field and, uh, and you know, the samurai attacks him with a spear. And, uh, yeah, like, of course, yeah. Anyway. And, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, and the peasant jumps backwards and, and, and grabs the, you know, he grabs the spear, uh, but not the sharp part of the spear, but behind the spear. He, you know, he grabs it behind the spear, and then he puts his hand over the spear, so so you know the spear can't slide through and stab me. And 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 every time the samurai, you know, in his samurai outfit, in the rice field, <laughs> jumps to stab him. The guy jumps back one, and then jumps back another one. You know. To prevent him from being punctured by the spear, and I thought, and I, I used to sit and listen to this Japanese famous master explain to a bunch of people, Japanese and foreigners, you know, and uh, you know, that's the way it's done. And and I would listen. I would look at the foreigners' faces, and the foreigners are like this. That's it. I want to shaking my head, thinking, see. But see now, see now. Here's the thing. So you know, forty years ago, people said that. Now, now everybody knows that's that's not true. But forty years ago, or they didn't know that, and they believed that that was the story. You know, now when I now when I tell that story, oh, McCarthy. You know, it reminds me of the famous quote, two of them, two quotes come to my mind. One is by Machiavelli. You know Machiavelli? Machiavelli, look him up. He's a very important person with regards to political science. And the reason why I talk political science is, is silent. <laughs> yeah, actually, political silence, that's what's happening in the United States right now. Sure. Uh, political science. And one of the reasons why political science is important is a great quote by, I'm not sure if it was Plato or one of these guys said, um, okay. Yeah. You know that. Uh, you know, I always do this. Oh, we're not interested in politics. Oh, he, he's too involved with politics. I always remember what Plato said. And I think it was Plato. I have to look, but it was like, okay. You don't like you don't like politics. Okay, no problem. We get it. But remember this. If you don't like politics and you don't want to be involved with it, don't complain about other people who are going to govern you. Oh, okay, so maybe just that alone might serve to give a little bit of inspiration for no other reason than to better understand the nature of political science, okay? So in, in this regard, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I got to, <clears throat> how can I better understand what people are talking about unless I know something about it? Anyway, you know, I'm just I'm looking at the, our one-hour interview and I realize, my God, it's already two hours. <laughs> I, I, I noticed there's no questions. I nobody was asking any questions. I, you know, I told you I could jump on a bandwagon and go all, all day long with this stuff. I, I love it so much. But you know, the point was simply this: uh, that, you know, um, uh, guys like Machiavelli, they told us, you know, uh, whenever you um, come up with an idea that seems to supersede someone else's idea, uh, right away for enemies. It doesn't matter if they're your brother or sister, your friends. If they if they are already doing well in the old way, 
and you come up with another way to look at the old way that might allow you to achieve your outcome in a more succinct fashion, <laughs> they're not going to like you. They're not going to support you. And they will see you as a very dis disrespectful. And and as I said, you know, there, there was uh, another, uh, another quote that came to my mind, and it was one about a guy named Arthur Schopenhauer. And Schopenhauer came up with an idea. He calls it the three stages of truth. And uh, the first, you know, when you come up with some idea, oh my God, I got an idea. You know, I've I've stumbled across some great idea. The first thing that's going to happen, and if you're, and especially if your idea is uh, uh, great and it's going to inspire a lot of other people. And you know, for me as a researcher, nothing, nothing is more gratifying than to give back to that abyss that's given me so much. And I thought, wow, that's great. Uh, this is a, uh, so, and thank God, there's more people who like it than dislike it. But Schopenhauer said this, first, you're going to be ridiculed. People are going to laugh at you and uh, ridicule you. Ah, oh, McCarthy, a fucking guy, an asshole, you know. And uh, number two, then they're going to, if the ridiculing doesn't work, then they're going to oppose you. And, uh, you know, depending on the nature of opposition, it can be, it can be violent as well. I mean, it just depends on what, you know, what I represent. I mean, you know, like, let's say, for example, what I represent is maybe uh, life-changing uh, and uh, some big, huge, multi-conglomerate realize, you know, this guy just invented uh, how to make energy from water. And, you know... All the people who have using fossil fuel and petrol, uh, blah, 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 these multi-billionaire uh, giants, you think they're, they're going to leave me alone? You know, like, you know what that represents? So all of a sudden, tomorrow, the guy disappeared. Oh, he had a heart attack or he fell off a cliff or something like that. You know, that's what I mean about opposition. So for me, it's not quite anything so glamorous. It's just, you know, I look at a way with which to embrace old practices to better understand God, that's that's really all what I did. And I brought it together into a single practice. And judging how many people have imitated uh, what I've done in the last uh, 30 years or so, uh, I say it's had a big impact on people. And, and because that threatened the insecurities of a lot of people who, that's not my style or who the hell is he? You know, that, I get a lot of uh, uh, people wanting to uh, try to discredit me and and, you know, <clears throat> they have a difficult time trying to discredit me because the facts speak for themselves. So they use ad hominem instead, you know, attack his character, you know, uh, look how fat he is or look how stupid he's got no hair or something like that, you know. Or, or he's not connected to la 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 in Japan, you know. So, and, and the last thing is, so there's ridicule, there's uh, this uh, opposition, violent opposition case. And then the last thing is, you know, you think, oh, my God, it's getting worse, it's getting worse, it's getting worse. But the worst part is not worse. It's, they call it evidence, self-evidency. Oh, we knew it before him anyway. We were doing it, but it's a secret in my style. But now that it's out, we'll tell you we've always been doing it forever, you know. And that's kind of like the story of Koruch and uh And so uh, there's a, uh, and we, and, you know, we use a little, we use a little, uh, uh, the the crest uh, uh, to represent the concept, uh, the principles of study, study and training together, and we make a large distinction. Learning is different from practice, and practice is different from training. So, so you must learn first, <clears throat> and the way you learn is not the same way that you practice. So when you learn a body of information, you then can practice it. And the purpose of practicing is to arrive at something that is uniquely yours. That's why everybody can't do the same thing the same way to get the same result. It, 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 it's not, it, it just based on the human body and the thing that happens between birth and death called aging. Just because of these natural phenomena, we're not capable of doing the same thing the same way. And because of that, we need to take a lesson from Toyama Kankan or Kinjo Hiroshi or, or, or any other people on this planet 
who believe in the same process. Your path, you can call, call a pathway whatever you want, but the pathway has to, in order to be an acceptable pathway, it should condition your body, cultivate your mind, and nurture your spirit. The only other thing is what, what you're practicing. Because the pathway in Kendo is not the same as the pathway in Shorinji Kenpo, or Sumo, or Goju, or Shotokan, or Kendo. The pathways are different. But it doesn't matter what the pathway is, it must be functional. Because if it's not functional, what happens is you wind up using overly ritualized practices, and they become dysfunctional. And re please remember this. Irrespective of what else karate may or may not be, it can fall into five separate categories. It can be an industry. And I make a joke, you know, no, sir. could be the oldest industry in the world. But then I remember, oh, there's, there's another one that's older than that. So maybe karate was designed to protect those people in that industry. Okay. The people who know me know what I'm talking about. I'll let I'll let the your friends make comments about what I'm what industry I'm talking about. That's the joke. Uh, it can be a form of physical fitness. Obviously, it's not uh, obviously it's not an aerobic, so it's an anaerobic form of physical fitness. Uh, it can be a sport and uh, uh, you know governed by rules and regulations. Uh, and it's it's not rocket science. So by understanding what the rules and regulations are, then they uh, they um, uh, they they establish a platform upon which uh, all your practices would lead toward the way you train to accomplish those outcomes. And uh, of course, as you talked about earlier, it can be a lifestyle. Uh, you know, um, and many of us uh, who are like-minded and come together share in the passion of this practice that brings us together. We 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 love the lifestyle, and we you know we use little bits of that lifestyle to enhance the living of our daily lives. Some of us, that's all we do is that, nothing else. But those four things I just described now, that's not why this mechanism was created. This mechanism, those are byproducts, by the way. Those are byproducts that came from the one source of origin. And these things come from the need to protect ourselves. Human uh, behavior can be violent. And, and I'm, I'm only talking domestic in a civil environment. I'm not talking warfare. That's another mechanism. So, so if we're talking about functional self-defense, empty-handed, one against one, and not, and I'm, once again, here I go on a tangent. I'm not talking about, hey, you looking at me? I don't like you, you, your girlfriend, I want to fight. I'm meeting you at 4 o'clock behind the corner to have a fight. No, I'm not talking about ego-related distractions or somebody picking a fight with you. Yeah, you might be fighting. You might be fighting to defend your honor, your father. Yeah, but that, no, no, no. That's, a, that's a mutual confrontation. Do you understand the difference between mutual confrontation and self-defense? Now, in mutual confrontation, you may be, <laughs> you may be fighting for your life. But that's, that, the, the, there's a choice there. The choice was, hmm, should I fight that guy or not? See, that's the choice. In self-defense, you don't have a choice. I got a bag of groceries. I'm getting into my, uh, I'm putting them in the back. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a woman. Uh, I just finished grocery shopping. I'm in the parking lot. Uh, I open the boot of my car. I'm going to put the, uh, the groceries into my trunk. I can jump from behind. He wants to steal my purse or my money or something. Okay, uh, I can't say, oh, excuse me, I need to warm up, you know, no, or, or you know, the world karate champion was attacked in the parking lot, you know, oh, let me see the jumping, spinning heel kick now, you know, you know, you can't because you were in, in your, it was a home invasion or you were in a telephone booth or crowded location or a ATM machine and, you know, I, Self-defense, that's what I'm talking about. And so if you want functional self-defense training, and, and you know, you and you're following the pathway of a 
uh, karate, you know, Japanese. Don't tell anybody, but Okinawa is part of Japan. You know, you're following the Japanese. <laughs> People don't get that. No, no, Okinawa is a different place. I always like to make the comparison between Hawaii and Okinawa. If you go to Hawaii and you say, you know, if you say uh, aloha, mahalo, brah, they'll understand you. But if you start speaking Hawaiian to people, they go, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You have to go way up into the mountains there. At, uh, there's a little community. They speak Hawaiian. We don't. <laughs> Aren't you Hawaiian? Yes, but uh, yeah, but uh, this is America. It's America. American money, American this, American that. You know, you know Okinawa. They speak in, in spite of the movement from 1992 onward to cultivate. You know, the you know the television series bring back the Okinawan language. Of course, like go to Okinawa and, and, and go walk up to some guy and, and start speaking Okinawan to him. You know, beyond the you know. Hi, Sai, Jari uh, Maturi, you know, probably not, not really going to be able to speak to you. And, and it's Japanese culture, it's Japanese food, it's Japanese money, it's, you know, and, and, and of course, we all want Rukyu culture to come back. Of course we do. We love it. We, we love the more laid back island mentality. It's more laid back there. It's a nice climate instead of the stormy weather. So it's, it's a beautiful place to be. You know, we want that. But it's it's uh, it's having a, a, the total understanding of what it is that we practice in real time and being able to understand its place and position uh, gives you the opportunity to um, uh, I, I want to use the term maybe better quantify what it is that we practice because today there's a lot of focus on you know you're from this style or you're from that style or you're from that style or you're another style you go, oh you're from that style oh, you can't go over there. Or if you go over there, you go and say, yes, oh, here's a letter, self-introduction. I go, I take my belt off, I'm, I'm going to become a member. Of, just coming on for a guest. Or, or if, and here's the funny part. You can practice karate. And you say, oh, I want to practice kobudo. So, you know, uh, basically there's a, there's four types of kobudo now, you know, uh, in Okinawa too. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> you can uh, practice it. You know, there's the, you know, there's a Yabi Kumoto and Kairoshin lineage, you know. And on the mainland, it was uh, you know, ratified by the you know, Inomoto Cuts and, and, you know, and, you know, Sakami Dusho and a few people uh, who were all kind of part and parcel of Kairoshin's movement. And then on the mainland, and then looking now, you know, the guys like uh, Akami Eiske, uh, the students of Kairoshin now, and then, you know, Akami Eiske, Sensei. God rest his soul, beautiful person. And, you know, Nakamoto Masahiro and, and so on. That's the Tairoshinkan portion. Yeah. You know, you know. And then, and then of course, you know, you have the Matayoshi uh, lineage from his dad, and um, which was a different style, by the way. You know, they, they're, 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 there are different dynamics. I don't give me. You know, if I was blindfolded and got hit in the head from a bow, and somebody said, hey, what style hit you with the bow? Oh, that was a, oh, that, oh, that was a, Oh, well, that's clearly a Mateo. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> anyway, don't get me started. And then, of course, there's the uh, uh, Yamani Ryu. And, uh, you know, interestingly enough, <laughs> you know, Yamani Ryu, uh, the first time that we had the uh, pleasure of uh, seeing Yamani Ryu in the Western world came from the Kishaba Dojo. You know, the Kishaba, uh, they came from the Nagamini Dojo originally. And then uh, uh, Kishaba went with the uh, Professor Shinzato up in Yonobaro at his house to create a little dojo. In the house, they broke away from uh, Matsuba Shodin Yu and the Kodo. Uh, and uh, they also use the word Uchinari, by the way. And uh, and uh, and two of the students who came from uh, that style, uh, from the Kishaba style, went to America. You know, back in the, uh, you know forty years ago, uh, Oshiro Toshiro and uh, Nishime uh, Kyoshi. I don't know if you know these two guys. There, I, I, I refer to them as uh, Kobodo Saints. They are so talented and so remarkably skillful. And they, they, and, and fortunate for fortune for us, we had someone like them uh, to show us what is humanly possible with uh, the style Yamaniru. 
But at the time, we didn't know that there was also, there are also a half a dozen other streams of Kobudo, uh, of Yamaniru that doesn't look anything like what they were doing, you know. But that's a, that's a topic for another conversation. And then there's, and then there's what they call uh, Mura. Uh, Mura, say. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> you hear that over there? That's Alexa, be quiet. That's my computer talking to me. She thought I was asking her a question. <laughs> uh, Mura, Mura Kobura, Mura, Mura Bojitsu, like, you know, uh, there, are, there are little pockets of uh, villages around uh, Okinawa that still practice old school, you know, and uh, they don't kind of fit in with the Yamane Ru or the, you know, the Tairoshik in the Yamane Matairoshikasa, but, and mostly we just see it in the, uh, you know, uh, festivals and stuff like that. But it's, it's still around, you know, and it's still it's still very. I have a Canadian friend of mine who's very very passionate about uh, uh, this uh, Cesar Borgaski in, in Toronto. Is, uh, he's another you know, very prominent researcher and loves keep alive the old school practices and stuff like that. But anyway, the point being this: is you could practice a Shorin Ru, Weichi Ru, Ishin Ru, you know, Goju Ru. And you might not necessarily be overly welcome over to another version of Goju-ru, but you're totally welcome to go to a Kobel Dojo because there's no conflict of interest, you see. And, and, and I say that arguably because there, there are some, some schools that do get along with each other. But as a rule, you know, there, there's, you can't have two captains on one ship, you know. It's, uh, you know, there's not the way it works in Karate, you know. You know, the, 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 they, they make the joke, you know, it's a it's a benevolent dictatorship, you know, and only one leader in each dojo type of thing, you know. And so uh, so uh, that's kind of the way I see that. I like to think of Kodu Uchinari in the same, in principle, same way. So you can practice any style of karate that you like and go and happily be welcome at any Kobudo dojo that you want. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, so... So when I started the Ryukyu uh, Karate Jokosai Kenkikai, the you know, International Ryukyu Karate Research Society, which I started in Japan, I made it specifically for people who were like-minded like me, who did not want to be inundated by the confines of style. You know, oh, you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. Oh, he's this or he's that. That you, you, you just you had that blinding flash of the obvious, the epiphany, but the moment that you went, <laughs> I like I like what he's saying, and I want to be part of that because I want to practice this all my life, and I like to think that somewhere in the learning curve that it leads you to a place where you feel, oh, okay, now I understand it. I'll give an example: if you say, for example, uh, we went to, uh, uh, you know, you go to school. And then, and, and get me started on the education system. I think that's a bad idea, but okay, that's my opinion. Okay, like not not what to learn, but how to learn. That's what I think you, we should all be doing. But okay, pretend it's a perfect world. When you let's say you finish high school, now you want to go to a tertiary level education university. So you can go. Uh, so, you, so so maybe it's open house. And there's many universities in your city. <clears throat> so you go to, I don't know, let's hypothetically, I go to the uh, University of Toronto, open house semester, uh, open house day. That's where all the different uh, 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 groups from the different faculties, you know, engineering, education, mathematics, science, law, medicine, they're all there in the auditorium. And you can go around and you go, hello, oh, hello, would you like a pen? Here's a hat, you know. <laughs> Uh, here's a drink, here's a beer, <laughs> I'll, I'll go to that one. <laughs> and, and you say, oh, you look at, uh, just as a matter of interest, this is the Faculty of Engineering, and there's civil, electronic, you know. Oh, um, um, can I ask you a question? I'm thinking about maybe studying engineering, and uh, uh, I'm thinking about maybe, you know, uh, electrical engineering or, or computer engineering, whatever you want. Know, Software engineer, software engineer. Can you tell me about the pathway? I mean, like, like how how do I? I don't know anything about it, 
uh, I'd like to be maybe an engineer because, you know, I can make a lot of money or it's a nice lifestyle or my dad was an engineer or, you know, whatever. I saw a movie. I want to be an engineer. But can you help me? Yeah, yes, of course. And, you know, then they take out the, you know, they call it the module descriptor. Yeah, module descriptor. Oh, now nowadays it's on a computer. But, oh, yes, here. Here's the module descriptor. You know, there's 22 subjects. Uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, eight semesters. Uh, it, it, it goes over a period of four years. Uh, you know, semester one, you get these subjects. And, uh, oh, let's look at one subject for men. Okay. Um, um, uh, okay. Um, let's say in this subject, uh, here's the uh, uh, lesson plans. And I can look at the lesson plan for day, uh, week, week five, uh, uh, lesson four. Uh, uh, here's the outcomes of that lesson. Uh, here's the study module. Uh, here are the assessment criteria. Uh, there are the assignments. And when we evaluate you, we look at these levels of competency and we mark you accordingly. Okay, so now I just say, make the deduction based on the abstract, and that's how you arrive at becoming, uh, getting your degree in engineering, right? Okay, so, so uh, and let's say, oh, I like that, and let's say I finished the four-year course. Hey, now I want to do a master's of engineering, okay? Mas and the master's of engineering works the same way. Module descriptor, outcomes, assessment criteria, lesson planning, a, you know, there's a dissertation, study, and, and then when you finish, you're a master of engineering. So where, where is this in karate? You know, the, 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 there's a science there and there's an art as well. So why can't you say, you know, oh, you're doing this style. Okay, so tell me, how does it work? Like, what am I going to learn in lesson five, week nine uh, of year two? What outcomes are they going to lead me to? How am I going to arrive there? What, what practices and so on? You know, nobody's doing that. Nobody ought to do that. I, I brought that in. That's why I was brought to Australia. I was challenged to create uh, the world's first undergraduate study. How to apply this methodology of science and art together in a pedagogical fashion to create uh, a program. Um, when I think back to those years, the only guy that I had who was really had my back to help support me was uh, Dr. Ronnie Kluger from Patak um, Tigwa in Tel Aviv, Israel. He's a uh, his, his background is in pedagogical studies. At the time, he had spent 17 years uh, at uh, Wingate Institute teaching, you know, and, uh, and he got it right away. He was, Patrick, I'm, I'm there to support you 100%. And thanks to him, he helped mentor me, massage these principles to introduce to academia. And that, there's a... <laughs> I just saw one of your readers come on and said, there's a reason for lots more conversations in the future. I would love nothing more than to have more conversations with you if you like. And if, and if there is a desire or a need to listen to more of what I say, I'm happy to do that. Igor, I'm like you. I'm, I'm still searching. I, I'm not, I've never given up. You know, I'm, that's, that's the passion. That's, I continue, you know, I'm always looking for better ways of doing the very same thing and better ways to understand it. And, and uh, more accommodating ways with which to help explain this to the disbelievers, the ones who don't believe it or, you know, he's, he's, he's wrong, he's wrong. And, uh, and look, if I was wrong, I would be the first guy to say I'm wrong. I mean, you know, I, my stuff is out there in the public domain for anybody to, uh, you know, um, criticize. And uh, <laughs> I don't know why people get upset about that. I, you know, companies pay big money to bring external sources in to criticize their work. It's called pro progress. <laughs> I get it for free. <laughs> I just get it for free. Oh, good God, you know. But, but a lot of this, it's because it's so ad hominem related, I just ignore it. I just, 
I don't give them any oxygen because uh, it's a joke and they're a joke. Uh, they're clowns. But all the people who are serious about, look at, uh, we'd like to discuss, a, a very, you know, we'd like to discuss this area of anthropology or uh, genealogy or uh, or this particular lineage or, you know, hey, uh, we think you've got a right idea, but you might be a little bit off based on this one and let's discuss it. I never get that. I never get it. But I've had lots of people come through our organization over the years who now have made sizable names for themselves. That's what they're doing. So I you know, it, it doesn't matter that uh, you're maybe not always getting a tap on the back. Uh, yes, thanks to Patrick McCarthy, we did this. Uh, okay. You know, imitation is uh, some form of flattery in any way, and I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm happy that there are a lot of people now thinking uh, that this is okay. Because I'm going to tell you something, back in the, back in the 1990s, back in the you know, mid to late 1990s, wow, I was getting attacked by everybody at his brother. I thought that somebody was giving uh, uh, prizes out for people wanting to discredit me. You know, if McCarthy can walk on water, it's because the bastard can't swim. You know, I, I, there was no way. So, is that enough for today? So, Hans, so, yes. I've heard, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard, uh, a lot of information, information to work with. Work with. Uh, what is your message to Mexican karate people uh, that you can... Uh, uh, told us, tell us, tell us. Oh my goodness! Uh, you know, first of all, uh, you know, when I started, so I said, "Buenos dias, mi amigo, un abrazo, mi amigo." You know, and I, you know, now I live here in Los Angeles. I, I'm only one block from uh, the very big uh, Mexican area down here in <laughs> San, San, San Diego. San Diego, one block over here, and uh, I spent a lot of time down there with. I love, I love your food, and the people, you know. The, People are not the friendliest here in Los Angeles. You know, they're not very friendly. You know, at all. you know, I live in this condominium. I go outside in the elevator. Oh, how are you? Oh, sorry, I go over to Santiago. Hey, rah, 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 and, um, food. The people are so friendly, and you know, I, in two seconds, I got a friend. And, and so we we hang out there a lot because it's it's kind of like it's kind of like a, a friendly neighborhood. Uh, so I, I, that's these days, that's my only window into Mexican culture now. Other than being a tourist back in, before the show started, we talked about me being in, in, in uh, and at the Tres Narices. And um, so um, I like to think this, that um, I, I know I have uh, uh, several good Mexican friends, yourself included, and I know how passionate uh, you are about um, this practice and um, for me if I could share any one particular avenue of thought then I would say this first uh, even though uh, your practice may appear very difficult and uh, you know hard don't ever give up and uh, the only one thing that can be guaranteed is when you give up your progress finishes so you know, uh, uh, two steps forward, one step back. It's okay. And 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 there's a great little philosophy. <clears throat> Actually, the philosophy was popularized by uh, Ford, uh, the manufacturing tycoon from automobiles. But it was somehow picked up by the Japanese, and uh, it's referred to in Japanese as kaizen. You know, the kaizen philosophy. Anyway, in English, we use it. Uh, we have an acronym that we discovered, C-A-N-I, which means can I. And uh, it means constant and never-ending improvement. And the, the philosophy behind this uh, inward struggle is that, you know, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Don't worry about uh, your black belt today if you're only a yellow belt. You know, the you, you, only thing that you need to make sure is, is that... Um, that you uh, improve a little bit each time you practice. Remember this, all progress is only ever made by the taking of careful measurements. Thank you, Steve Bellamy. So you need to have a place to start and you need to record somehow, microphone, iPhone, 
computer, notebook. You know, I know this is hard to believe, but in my day, we had a book, and we used to write in it with something called a pencil. <laughs> but anyway, you, you know, so, so the purpose there is when you look back one week, one month, one year, one decade, one score, when you look back, you can see where you once were and where you are now. So you're able then to divide up and understand your progress. That's what I mean by that. So my message to uh, young people in, in Mexico, for example, is Cali, is don't give up. And 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 even when you're feeling bad, oh, I'm, you know, I'm no good, or he's better than me. Don't measure yourself against anybody else ever, <laughs> unless you're in competition and you're a professional boxer. <laughs> because then, uh, if you're not as good as the other guy, nobody wants you. Type of thing. You know, that's all about money. That's business. We get that. So don't, you know, uh, don't compare yourself with other people. Uh, continue to struggle because I don't know anybody in the world who's ever become successful slash happy uh, made easy. Uh, and adversity, trouble, you know, things that are difficult, tend, the more difficult they are, the more reward at the other end. So adversity becomes the lesson itself. In fact, if it's not difficult, you're probably not going to go anywhere. I mean, can you imagine if training was simple? Everybody could do it. <laughs> how long does it take to get a black belt? Well, that's a question a lot of people ask. You know, how long does it take for the average person to get a black belt? And the joke is, well, average people don't get black belts. You know? and, then that, and that's only if you use that yardstick to measure, you know, who you are. A black belt. Who cares? Who cares what the... You know, who cares what color the belt is, for God's sake. You know, the, what's important is the functionality behind what you're doing. And there, there's another reason for a description on belts uh, another time. But my message would be this. You know, uh, also making sure that you're in the right line, that's a kind of an important thing, you know, because you could spend many years in one line. And, you know, e even if you get to the head of the line, you might realize, like I did, I'm in the wrong line. You know, I was in the wrong line. So, and that's one reason why it's important. I think indoctrination, you know, unless you're in the military, um, is uh, is not a good thing. You know, uh, learning how to learn. The, so what, learning what to learn, the, the, what you have to learn is percussive impact, how to impact something. If you can learn how to impact something, you can learn which tool, fingers, fists, head, elbows, shooting foot, if you're going to use a limb to strike something, you have to understand the theory of force, mass times acceleration. So how then do you generate the body mechanics to provide the acceleration into an inanimate object uh, to uh, 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 to get your to accommodate your outcome? That's what percussive impact is about. And if you're going to understand percussive impact, shouldn't you also learn what it does scientifically or medically to the inanimate object that you're striking. And if, and then, maybe from a holistic or a medical point of view, should you learn maybe how to help the person and heal it as well at the same time. That's the greater sphere of what brings us together. And then the only thing other than percussive impact is the seizing part. And that's joint manipulation, limb entanglement, blood and air deprivation, balance displacement, fighting on the ground, escapes and counters, joint pressure. But that's a lot of stuff. So... Where do you go to say, hey, what are you teaching? How do I get there? But, you know, you walk into a dojo or Mogun or Dojang and say, hi, what do you teach here? How do you get there? Not too many teachers are, you know, wanting to come up and explain that to you. So shut up, get in line and train, you know. <laughs> or, 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 sorry, or at the other end, ah, <laughs> welcome to the McDojo. We have everything here for you. Please, at a five thousand dollar. You know, I mean, so you know, and you can uh, we give you a black belt right away. Come on, you know. So but there's, <laughs> there's 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 the good, the bad, and the ugly, so to speak. So my my advice: find uh, somebody that you can work with who you respect. Um, and, and whether their whether their pedigree or their uh, you know is impeccable or not, I'm not, I'm not sure that's so important. 
and uh, you know, and whenever I see most successful dojos, I, I kind of see a com combination of a smart businessman or business team uh, who enjoy working with people. And um, what can be more rewarding than that, you know? So have fun. Don't, you know, even if you hate what you're doing, if you see the light at the end of the tunnel, don't be afraid to continue uh, grasping or reaching toward it and never give up. That's my message. And then, so I am making a lot of efforts to, to make Colchinadi known in Mexico. Yes, so I I've think got this. <laughs> so I think. You... Hey, by the way, by the way, did you did that guy? Did that guy co contact you um, uh, last week? Remember a guy? A guy wrote to me and he said, "Oh, do you have Coruñanari in uh, in uh, Mexico?" And I gave him your name and I said, "Oh yeah, uh, please contact the Paco." At the... I gave him. Did he contact you? No. I think it was a friend. I can't remember his name. I get so many. I you know I two three hundred emails every day, so I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I can't remember what his name was, but uh, I just remember he was in Mexico and he said, do you have any representatives? And I said, I mentioned your name. I gave me your contact details. And I said, please, I said, this is one uh, uh, person who is very passionate about what we do. He travels all over the world uh, to bring back his learnings and uh, teach him at his in Mexico. And, uh, and please go and, and visit him. And I, it was just like a week ago, so I haven't heard back from him. And I'm just hope, I'm hoping that you know he, I'm hoping that he got a hold of you. And if not, I'm hoping that. And I realize that because of the language barrier, which is, I wish I could speak uh, Spanish. You know, uh, I only can speak a very little bit. You know, and uh, but if it was in Japanese, I could speak to you. And then, and my French is maybe passable. But, um, and or if I like, you know, I, I can, you know, I can manipulate a few languages. Spanish, sadly, is not one of them. And we have a big following in Spain. You know, we're in yeah. Madrid and Barcelona and Santa Santander and down south and a lot of. Uh, oh yeah, David Fernandez Pará, you spoke to before. Uh, he's my, uh, he's our representative in in Spain. Another great guy. I would and anybody who might uh, not be able to. Uh, uh, get the interpretation of our interview. I'm sure maybe you're going to do that. You're going to do a voiceover later to discuss what we were talking about. And, and uh, uh, you know, we're very open to uh, uh, meeting and from all over the world. And of course, particularly, I, I was hoping I could come to Mexico because you know, I'm border, I'm borderline in Mexico. Now. Close, I'm not. this far away now, and now I can go because you know I said oh because I had such a busy overseas work schedule, and, and you know when I finally got situated here one year ago, I had to go to New York, and I had to go to Canada, I had to go to Europe, and I go back, and then by the time I was in, in March, I said oh I just have to you know my son's a lawyer, so. He was in San Francisco. I drove, I said, we're going to drive to San Francisco. I'm going to spend a few days. Then we're going to visit Napa Valley to get a few drinks of vino. And then we're going to come back. And then I'm going to talk to you. We're going to go to Mexicali. And, and, and then, boom, the COVID virus pandemic happened. I went, oh, my God, I didn't go anywhere. You know? And I wanted to go to, you know, my my dear friend, uh, Grandmaster Chuck Merriman is in, uh, in Arizona. And, I have other good friends in Nevada. You know, we, we were, had our hands tied. We couldn't go to visit those people now because of the, of the pandemic. And, uh, oh, God, what are we going to do now type of thing, you know. But I don't know when this is going to finish. And now I told you, because living in America was not what we thought it was going to be like, we've decided to, I mean, my, my neighborhood is so violent here. You know, I, I have a little, I have, a, I have an app on my telephone. Um, it's about crime rates. And I and, and forget the whole city, just my street. Every day I get the police reports, burglary, shootings, stabbings, knifings, uh, theft, uh, assault, rapes. My wife is afraid to go out at night. Uh, it's, uh, you know, anyway. And then the homeless, the homeless pe uh, epidemic here, mental illness, uh, how expensive it is, traffic. It's not what we thought. So, uh, you know, maybe to other people, uh, it's a great thing. But for us, we want to go back. Uh, oh, Christina.
<laughs> yes, Christina, that's right. I agree with you. We all want to travel together again, my love. And and so and so we're we're leaving. We're gonna go back to Japan. You know, I mean, we love Japan. We love Japanese culture. We love uh, we we love everything about Japan. And and uh, the only problem was it was kind of far away from the world, so to speak. You know. But so, and uh, so that's where, so you're going to have to come and meet me now in Okinawa. Yeah. So and, uh, someday, someday we're going to make it possible to, <laughs> to have you here. In well, Mexico. that's what I'm going to do. That's what my plan is. My plan is when we go back to Japan, we're going to, uh, we're going to relocate to Okinawa because of the weather. And it's, thank God, it's also the home of uh, the island of Karate. So, and we're going to have a, I'm going to buy a house there and I'm going to set up a little dojo. And so people can come to visit me from overseas, and uh, I pro I'm probably not going to be, I'm probably not going to get too involved with the, uh, you know, the sport karate movement over there. You know, I have a village, village karate school. And hey, by the way, Kodu Uchinari will finally be represented in Okinawa, right? So there it is. <laughs> what are my detractors going to do now? <laughs> <laughs> so Hanshi, thanks a lot for for your time for for your enthusiasm and hope to see you soon or maybe again in one of these uh, interviews so so thanks a lot and gracias a todos los que nos vieron <laughs> y so it's it's time to to end so so it's been a, it's been a pleasure and i want to thank you and i want to thank all of your uh, listeners uh for their comments and uh I hope, uh, I hope it goes somewhere. I hope that we uh, get some mileage from this. And I, I look very much forward to hopefully seeing you in person. Uh, and if that's not possible, then, of course, we're chatting again via uh, online. So, gracias, mis amigos. Adios. Adios.